Members of Council, can I have members of Council come up to the Council Chambers, please? Members of Council, if you're in the, your office, can you please come up to the Council Chambers? Okay, members of council, if you can please take your seats. We do have quorum. <coughs> members of council, this meeting is now resumed. Please rise for a moment of silence. And during this time, remember the following person who has passed away, Bob Acton. Thank you. Members of Council, we will not review and confirm the order paper. To this point, Council has completed 181 items. There are four items left on the agenda. I will now take the release of holds. Please put your name under request to question staff. Do we have any release of holds? Do we have it? Uh, Councillor Layton, did you get your letter in yet? Did you get your letter in? No, or I, 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 I'm, if it's all the same to you, I'd just like to deal with them in order. All right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. So we'll start. Our first item is on, oh, on favor of the order paper. Recorded. Councillor Layton, please. The order paper is adopted unanimously, 25 in favour. Okay, our first item is on page 2, PW 13.11, 10-year cycling network plan. Questions to staff. If you can put your name up, request a question. Councillor Holliday. Uh, hold. <laughs> hold. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I did have, uh, thank you for the supplemental report. It was very helpful. I did have a question. There's a reference in the supplemental report, if I can find it, uh, talking about polling. And in the Bloor Street bicycle lane project, I'm going by memory here, that it was a 2.5 kilometer area and there were 29,000 contacts required for that survey and it was a drawing a, a parallel to polling can you tell me of the 29,000 how many lived on Bloor Street itself versus the area uh, through the chair uh, we wouldn't know that number exactly but the area I mean we did we typically do several hundred meters around the project site so it would impacts all the nearby neighborhoods as well so if you look solely along there a rough estimate for two and a half kilometers maybe several hundred um, business frontages and potentially uh, residential units along there. So if I get this right, it was a two and a half kilometer radius. No, 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 a two and a half kilometer stretch of roadway, linear stretch of which we then, do you remember the number? I think went um, several hundred meters yeah, off of the main route. Off. 
Oh, several hundred meters off of the main route. Correct. So the radius is several hundred meters along the length, and that captured 29,000 people. Correct. Any, any guesses as to what number would actually live on the road? Yeah, or again, would be a target? I, I, I would roughly estimate there'd be several hundred uh, business frontages, and then often there are second story uh, units and also apartment buildings along those corridors. So again, you're probably looking at several hundred more, maybe low thousands, two thousands. Okay, and so if we were, if we were three or four thousand, say, and you said the price per ballot was $2.75, would it be safe to say it would be less than $10,000 worth of polling to, uh, to actually pull just the people on the street? Yeah, for the chair. Again, the concern here is like uh, when you're doing polling on a specific street that has, I'll say, more area-wide or regional implications, um, relying only on the opinions of those that live adjacent, I, while we do factor them into our decision-making, um, would, se would seem to be a little challenging and limiting. Would the, would the net effect of the, the cycling lanes be different for somebody that lived four or five hundred meters away from Bloor Street than it would be that someone had a front? And so say a business, you know, looking at the removal of, uh, of a lane or removal of parking, would they have a different set of concerns than somebody several hundred meters away? For the chair, I'm sure, yes, they would. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, but what we try to do is look at sort of um, overall area-wide impacts as well. Okay, would it be, would it be safe to say that in a, in a larger project, polling, if, if we wanted to poll just the people that live on the street, if we wanted to ask them a question, it would be far less than 1% of the project cost? Uh, 10,000 compared to a million? Um, I, I, you know, for Bloor Street, for instance, we probably spent several, I'll say low hundreds of thousands of dollars initiating all that work. So if we did $10,000 worth of polling, it might be several percentage points of the, of the, of the overall study costs. And, and what about the overall project costs, you know, a couple million dollars versus 10,000? Uh, again, probably several percentage points. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I can uh, remember to ask you right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Men and Wong. Yeah. Uh, um, what is staff recommending for the annual expenditures of the, on this capital plan? Uh, through the chair, currently the, the staff recommendation would be to look at doubling the amount of money we spend on cycling infrastructure from roughly eight million dollars a year to sixteen. So, where's your where's your funding source? Uh, through the chair, over the years we've been getting a little uh, more pointed in terms of how we do our budgeting, and uh, I'll say since I've uh, arrived here, we've looked at ways uh, that we often built in things like contingencies in a project that we weren't often using. So we're trying to find all of these funding sources within the existing funding envelope. So you said you're trying to. So, yes. so when you've increased, uh, you're increasing, you're doubling from what, 80, was it 88 million to, what, what was it, what is it now? It, it is roughly um, over 10 years, 9 million. 56. 88 million? Uh, about, the increase is about 56 million over 10 years. Sorry, what is the funding rate now on the, pr Roughly, on the previous bikeway report that was approved by council that was 88 million something, or 80 million, something like this, wasn't it? Roughly over a 10 year period, that'd be correct. And so, so what are you proposing to change that to now? Uh, again, an increase of uh, 56 million on top of that. And so, um, you said you're trying to, which means, am I meant to, I, I, I could interpret that to mean is you actually don't have a funding source for it. No, I, every year we go through the budget process, Councillor, and we have projects that get delayed, deferred. We get better cost estimates that often bring prices down. Um, so we go through all these each and every year to, to do a look ahead for our 10-year capital programming. So again, there are often opportunities to find within our existing capital budget um, opportunities to find new initiatives. Um, and um, enhancements to existing projects. So, but you also have, bu you also have projects that go over budget, yes? Uh, in transportation services, we do not typically have too many Sorry, that go over budget. in terms of which services? Transportation services. We do yeah. not have a, a, a track record of many projects going over budget. Many projects going over budget. So, when you say that, that there's a cushion in all these projects, so you're telling me there's fat in, in, in the estimates of, in these projects? No, uh, there are, we always do put contingencies in, but what we've done over the past year to sort of make this uh, a little better is we recognize we are functionally leaving money on the table every year by building in uh, what were probably contingencies that were too high. Our projects are fairly simple and straightforward. They're on the surface. There are often very little unknowns. Um, so when we do actually implement them, we do, have not historically tapped that contingency uh, all that much. 
And for instance, uh, the last few years, we've been lowering the amount of contingency in those budgets, which has freed up additional capital what, dollars. What have you done with those contingencies now? I mean, every year you, there are contingencies. What have you been doing with that money? Well, uh, we obviously reallocate it, and that shows up in our capital budget ask every year. We show projects that have increased budgets, and we show projects that have decreased budgets. So you spend that on other things, or? Uh, yes, basically other transportation priorities. So, I'll, you know, the, should I be concerned that we should just be lowering contingencies on all your projects? To, and that, that the, I mean, this is a real concern to me, uh, Madam Chair, that, 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 we're, that we've been giving contingency to transportation services, and there, there's, there's generally extra money on the table. And, and, you know, I think the budget chief should be concerned that we've been approving budgets that, um, that are too high. Should we be looking at your, at the, at your department's budgets and maybe uh, sharpening our pencils? Because there always seems to be contingencies, and you never seem, as you say, you never seem to be going over budget. Yeah. No, again, that's exactly what we did, Councillor. So the fact is, for things like paving projects, which are fairly simple and straightforward, there are often not a lot of unknowns. More complex projects, such as underground, underground projects, large capital projects, buildings, facilities, um, there are always engineering contingencies into the, into the construction. So I, I think it's fair to say you need to look at and you need to have a contingency that is appropriate for that type of project. Ours, again, are fairly simple and straightforward. Um, we've lowered our contingency to free up additional dollars to do additional work. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> How many complete street studies are currently ongoing? Uh, I'm sorry, through the chair? How many complete street studies are currently ongoing? Um, complete streets, the a, a port, report itself has not been adopted, uh, but basically we're embedding complete streets in many of the road reconstruction projects that we do. How many pending? studies are there? I, I, there, is, there, there, are, there is no projects that are defined as complete streets. Complete streets is a way in which we design streets when we do reconstruct them. So there are not necessarily any complete streets projects per se. How do you roll out a complete streets project? Uh, well, no, uh, basically what we're doing is complete streets are when we are resurfacing or reconstructing a street. We're looking at how we do things such as where we locate curbs, what are the crossing lengths, how do we stripe the streets, those are all elements um, that we cook into how we design uh, projects from the outset. So um, it's, it's a philosophy about how we design or redesign streets more so than it is about being a project category. Right. So that would, that would be an overlay to an existing capital project. If an if a arterial road is going to be redone, then you would look through perhaps a complete streets lens to see what else you can do. Within existing budgets, that's correct. Uh, now, there's some numbers in the report about uh, projected, um, I guess you call them center line kilometers of bike lanes. Currently, how many, um, how many bike lanes, uh, on street uh, bike lanes, kilometers do we have now? What? Uh, through the chair, uh, 115 center. center line. And are those uh, on street or segregated, or you don't differentiate? Those are just painted. Uh, those would be painted, uh, would not include cycle tracks. So this is a pretty dramatic uh, investment. This is a pretty dramatic report that's in front of us for increasing over the next, I mean, it's a long period of time, but still. <laughs> uh, in the past few years, how many, how many new projects have been um, completed south of Bloor? Uh, south of Bloor, Councillor? Um, probably a handful, I think we have. I mean, it depends on how you define projects. So we have Wellesley, uh, Hoskin, Harvard, Richmond, Adelaide, Simcoe, um, and then also some sort of uh, quiet street type routes, Sherborne as well. So um, fairly significant number, and most of those were uh, placed as cycle tracks. And north of Bloor? Yeah, uh, north of Bloor, I'd say the largest extent is probably trail expansion up uh, north of Bloor. And, and looking, looking ahead, is the emphasis on connecting broken trails or, or connecting on-street bike lanes or, or a bit of both? Uh, through the chair, again, it's uh, connect, grow, and renew. So the one thing we want to do is, one complaint we've often heard is that the, the current network is disjointed. Um, the intent here was to bring forward a plan that is comprehensive, long-term looking, um, and building out a full network so that uh, folks can travel throughout the city. So it would be uh, connecting both trails and on-street facilities are both a priority. So is the emphasis connecting what's broken now or creating new? 
Uh, again, it, it's a balancing act. There's a little that you would probably would classify in each bin. This council just approved a significant new, uh, if we consider Bloor Street. Uh, through the chair, yes, that'd be fair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Layton. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Just on three points, it's typical of, of, of most projects, both transportation and otherwise, to pull the area around a, a, around a change, not just those properties that are affronting it. Uh, through the chair, we only use polling in selected situations, Councillor. Um, in most cases for projects like this, we tend to just do public online survey, which is part of our typical consultation process. Um, but the notification for that is both on the street that's, uh, that the project is and the surrounding area that might be impacted. That is correct. Um, we'll do um, often mailed um, flyers and also unaddressed, which means that we're going door to door and inserting them in, in doors and mailboxes. For example, a planning application, I know you might not be able to answer it, but there's a certain distance that, that notice is given um, as, a, as, as a measure of from the site, not along the street frontage. I could get the, the chief planner to, to answer that perhaps, or if, if you can. Um, through the chair, um, we, we roughly look at notification in, in an area about four to 500 meters. We work on that with public consultation. And again, depending on the extent of the impacts to the community, uh, we may increase or shrink that. Thank you very much. Um, budgeting for consistencies. This is a typical process for construction projects? Uh, the process of what? Doing a long-term plan? No, putting a budget in for contingencies. Oh, uh, through the chair, yes. Um, again, depending on the complexity of the project, typically what you'll see is uh, anywhere from 10 to 20%. Uh, for projects like ours, are, like I said, are pretty uh, simple in most cases. There are not a lot of unknowns. Uh, you tend to see contingencies can come down in that manner. You've worked for a couple of municipalities. Are there any municipalities that, that you know of that don't put a little bit of a budget for conti uh, contingency in just in case there's something, an unknown under the ground? It, it, contingencies are cooked into almost any nope. engineering project. What happened if you didn't budget for a contingency and all of a sudden you found a pipe that shouldn't be there, you found there, there was an unforeseen problem? What would you have to do? Uh, often we'd have to come back to council to ask for an increase in the budget and that could lead in for each and every project we do, which is in the hundreds. Um, could lead to us coming back, could delay projects as well as we sought approval. Delay projects, leave big giant holes in the road just because you have to come back for an overage that you probably could have guessed you would have had. Uh, yes. Um, how much more was the option that council chose to remove the gardener than the option to remove the gardener? Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, Mr. Rossini may be able to uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, based on the current uh, Class D estimates that we have, it's $400 million. There. $400 million more than the remove option. Can you tell me what, um, when, when we debated it at Council, what was the funding source for that $400 million? At the first time that uh, it came to Council, it wasn't identified and we were directed to include it in the 2016 budget, which we have now done so in okay. the approved 2016 Thank budget. you very much. Thank you. Councillor Campbell, questions. Good morning, Mr. Buckley. Uh, in regard, so you currently we are spending eight million a year to on the cycling infrastructure. Through the chair, that is that is correct. So the the additional incremental eight million that funding is to be found from within transportation services existing ongoing budgets yeah so over the 10-year budget we are giving a budget envelope and again on a year-to-year -year basis due to projects either getting increased costs lower costs being deferred being advanced um, every year we have to play with our numbers uh, but we do that in consultation with the financial planning unit um, and our goal is to always remain within that envelope so with the additional expenditure on bike lanes, what will, what will not get done in terms of road work, resurfacing? Uh, it's always difficult to predict, Councillor. Every year, we're, look at, we're looking basically at the entire program. So we may have things that were in, say, years seven, eight, or nine, and due to some known circumstance, like, for instance, uh, we reinspect the bridge and figure out that it actually may last longer. We might actually take funding like that and push it out beyond the 10-year window, freeing up capacity. So that's an example of how we, each and every year, have to shift funding around. So would you agree that we, as a city, generally wait far too long for resurfacing of, of our roads? 
uh, through the chair, we've been uh, slowly attacking our backlog. Uh, in the past few years, we've doubled the amount of money we spent on arterial resurfacing. So that's why we're seeing um, some of our worst roads get picked off. And also at the same time, uh, we're seeing more construction on the major roads. As we did have a backlog, but we are working through it. You'll acknowledge that some of our local roads, our arterial roads, they're almost at the point of crumbling before they, they get attended to. I mean, I look at Scarlet Road in, Toronto, in, the, in the West End, which cuts through uh, wards three and four, and that is in such a deplorable state that people have put in claims against the city. So, so that's an example of how bad the state of the roads are. Won't this transference of money, you know, just uh, extend that sort of situation and more circumstances? Uh, through the chair, no. We, I mean, first, we have again doubled the amount of spending that we placed on arterials. Um, those roads we're getting to. I think one of one of the we have had a significant backlog. Again, the doubling of the funding has helped quite a bit. <clears throat> the other piece, too, is that we're doing a better job on coordinating projects. So in some cases, we're actually not getting to projects when perhaps transportation services would like to, but we're doing it because we're delaying it for other utilities to be able to get in, and we're in and out only once. So that, that is often why we see some of our, um, the, the, particularly the arterial roads, in such condition that they are. But again, we have a plan moving forward. The backlog of the worst of the worst um, is getting um, brought down. Now, you, uh, the report mentions the requirement for additional staff for things such as winter snow clearing and street sweeping. Are, are, is this a, a serious? I'm looking at page three. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, maintenance service and winter snow clearing street. I mean, is this, we need to hire additional staff for that? For the chair, it is not additional staff um, for, for those services. So the, the new staff that's required, the four <coughs> new staff in 2017 yep. and two new staff, can, I mean, this is, given, given, the, given the, the size of transportation services staff, cannot this extra work be incorporated into the, the work plan of existing staff? So uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor, <coughs> in the last few years, uh, the staff are actually for capital delivery. So every project we do, as we've mentioned, each project that's listed in here, we will do some level of consultation, some of it very extensive, some of it may not be much. Um, they will be capital funded staff, which would be no different than us going out and say hiring a consulting firm to do that on our behalf. Comes funded out of the capital budget um, and will not be um, basically an operating pressure on the city staff. For instance, though, we have been absorbing additional work in the past three years. Um, if you look back to <clears throat> 2012, the transportation services budget, we delivered $150 million in capital projects. In the past year, combined with engineering and construction services, we delivered $300 million in capital projects. So we have been absorbing a lot more capital work with existing staff. Um, at some point, though, to, again, do additional work with no additional staff isn't realistic. Well, I'll just say that my, my confidence in the continuation of these efficiencies would be greater if you were staying with the City of Toronto. <laughs> Acknowledged. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> Councillor Campbell. I like your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Crawford. Fashion statements, is that right? Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Just some uh, questions to the, uh, uh, Mr. Buckley. So just clarifying some of the numbers that uh, I'm hearing. So you're looking at spending $8 million more a year on recycling infrastructure over the next 10 years? Uh, through the chair, it, it ends up being uh, 56 million over the 10-year window. So it's it's over the over the 10-year window. Okay, and and you were saying that you were you're confident that you can find it within your existing budgets. Yes, we continue to look every year, Councillor. Again, um, folks think that when you plan capital budgets, they're static. Um, in many cases, they're not. Projects move ahead, move back. Price prices come up, prices come down. So every year, it's a dynamic um, element. Um, again, we have overall roughly a 400 three to four hundred million dollar capital budget every year um, and we'll figure out a way to sort of make this work. So if we decide as a council that we weren't moving forward with this extra eight million dollars a year then that would open up eight million dollars or fifty six million dollars over ten years to look at other priorities? Uh, through the like chair fixing again. Roads, perhaps, uh, or, or other when you're looking at other priorities like fixing roads things that really need to get done? Yeah uh, through the chair again um, much of the underlying uh, genesis of this plan is about safety. We uh, whether folks want to admit it or not we do have more and more cyclists on the street each and every year um, and providing a safe environment for the cyclists again one of our classes of vulnerable road users um, is important so again uh, we balance all these things within transportation services. We're in charge of safety. We're in charge of multimodal mobility. So all of these are competing uh, needs. And again, we put them in and consider them amongst one another for the capital budget. 
and uh, when you're looking at your capital budget, what's your ca yearly capital budget, if you remind me again? Uh, roughly $300 million uh, each year, and then we typically bring forward about uh, $90 million of, of carry-forward carry funds or projects underway. Okay, a uh, question to the CFO. When we're looking at issuing our debt, our yearly debt, to sort of service all of our capital, how much of that, first of all, what, what sort of yearly debt do we do we do in the city overall? Well, through you, Madam Speaker, we have approvals between 600 and 900 million dollars a year. Last year, I believe we did seven. It was either seven or 750, and that's our plan again this year. Okay. Million. And with, with transportation, um, the, the directors mentioned uh, around 300 million dollars. What percentage of that is your? What I want to know is what is the co what is the capital debt cost just for transportation a year? Or what, so the, we, the capital, well, the, the, the debt that we issue to be able to do all the things we need to do in the city, where does transportation lie in that? He said it's $300 million. So uh, about half of our debt charges, our debt financing costs, are transit. And about half of the other half is transportation because transit and transportation make up about 70% of our capital funding. So about 70% of our debt charges is really for transit and transportation. So if you can give me a dollar figure, what is our yearly so, debt So uh, our debt charges this year are 400, I forget, it's 460 million or 480 million. I can tell you in a second, I just need to pull it out. And so about 70% of that would be transit and transportation. I'll it's tell big, you. It's a big number. Second. It's a big number. So our debt charges this year, $463 million. So any opportunity that we can to, to lower our capital costs on items that we may not necessarily need, and I get, you know, I'm not saying I, I'm against uh, increasing the, uh, the, the, the increasing the, the cycling network, but we need to look at those priorities because at the end of the day we have to pay for this and the interest keeps going up yearly. Where are we looking at next year when looking at our capital sort of uh, costs going up? Yes, so next year our uh, capital financing costs are increasing about 80, $80 million. That's excluding the pressure to, to deal with the pooling compensation which we really took out of capital. And that's spread about evenly between uh, CFC, which is our down payment on capital, and debt charges. And that's not even taking into consideration the $29 billion capital backlog that we have. So capital costs are rising and will continue to rise because we, we have lagged behind over so many years on our capital. Thank you. Last question. The city manager, and this, maybe the city manager can ask, ask this, uh, in our long-term uh, fiscal strategy that we're dealing with right now, we have a 2017 coming up. We have a huge pressure and problem coming up in 2017. Can you, do you agree to that? And when we're I, looking at the priorities we need to be deciding on. I do agree that we have a fiscal challenge in 2017. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Shiner, questions? Councillor Shiner? So, uh, the cur currently, there is an EA underway for part of Young Street. <coughs> what section of Young Street are we considering adding a dedicated lane to? Uh, through the chair, uh, currently there is an EA looking at Shepherd just to just north of Finch. So just north of Finch would come up to, I believe it's Bishop, Bishop. one block north? Yes, at the uh, Finch Hydro Corridor Trail. And <coughs> at Bishop and Finch, from there north, <laughs> on the roadway, is it not in rush hours uh, a dedicated bus lane along the side of Young Street right up to Steeles? Uh, through the chair, it's, uh, it's a shared bicycle and transit lane. <laughs> it's an HOV lane, sign, and it's buses. Now, those buses are coming out of two bus terminals at the location, the TTC bus terminal, uh, which is the end of the Young Street line, and they're also coming out then of the Go York Region bus terminal? Uh, through the chair, yes, that is true. Do you know how many buses are using that terminal every day? I probably would estimate in the hundreds. How about in the thousands? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That's the end of the system, is it not? And from there, anyone who wants to continue north up to uh, Steeles or up into York Region, all of the York Region buses, the Viva buses, the York, any other York Region buses, they all have to come down, and the GO buses to that terminal? Uh, through the chair, we can get that number for you if you'd like, Councillor. But I. It's very busy. I don't. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's it's probably the busiest. Particularly rush hour. Yes. It's the busiest bus terminal. So, you had plans to do an EA that would have extended that route from that location up to Steeles. It it was listed in the plan, but it's currently there's not uh, funding uh, identified for it. And it was originally identified for next year. Uh, it, it it was something that was being considered, but the funding was not available in the plan. My apologies. So. Right, but it was a 2017 project, I believe, when you showed it to me yesterday, if funding was made available. If funding is made available for it, Council. So it was your intention to continue that uh, study and bring those, bus, those bike lanes all the way up to Steeles yeah. Avenue if the funding was available? I, I have to apologize for you on this one. It, it was listed in the plan, but it, didn't, it showed a, a date, but it was, it was listed as an unfunded project in the fine print. So, so it was, I, I, I agreed it's yeah, unfunded yeah, yeah. because we only funded the 16 work. Correct. Nothing for 17 is funded yet, is it? Correct. So all the 17 projects are unfunded? Correct. So you were looking at doing it next year, if you could get funding? It, it was considered, and it, didn't, it wasn't deemed a priority for 17 with the, with the funding constraints that we had looked at. So. Okay. Right. Thank you. Councillor Mamalidi. Do we do... Um, do we do counts on the road of, of, uh, of bicycles? Uh, through the chair, we do do them at select locations throughout the city, um, often on an annual basis, and we also have permanent counters which give us information about day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month fluctuations. So how many cyclists use our roads? Um, <clears throat> every, day, or every day, the latest mode share that was identified was roughly 2.3% of the trips in Toronto were made by bicycles. 2.3? As of 2011, I believe. We can also say from surveys that we've undertaken that actually 54% of the people who live in Toronto identify themselves as being cyclists. No, no, that's not the question I asked. The question I asked was how many cyclists use our roads in Toronto? Again, about 2.3% of the population based on uh, data from about five years ago. And what would that amount to in terms of bikes? Um, I guess if you assume that there's... Uh, Two and a half million people, you're looking at roughly 40,000, 50,000 trips, uh, people making trips by bike each day. And, if, and I would say that the majority of them are in the downtown part of the city, not necessarily the suburbs. Uh, through the chair, the highest concentration does tend to be in a downtown core. Have you thought about a model in, in, um, in licensing those bikes if they want to use the downtown part of the city? Uh, through the chair, we actually have looked at this. Uh, the licensing of cycling uh, would be a, create a large bureaucracy in and of itself and would be difficult to enforce. But yet the, uh, the system we created yesterday where we're looking at landlords, that's not going to create a bureaucracy? Uh, through the chair, again, I, I, it's not my area of expertise. I'll, um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. I think if it's about well, protecting I, I would, public interest, would, would, there might be different um, standards that are applied to that versus this. I would think what I'm trying to achieve is a cushion on, your, on, on the amount of money that you're looking for. So in other words, if there's a, a system in place that could help absorb the money you're looking for for this 10-year plan, it could very well be licensing those, those bikes. Through the chair, uh, I think there's a whole host of revenue sources that could be used, but most of our road system is funded by property tax. So um, anyone who uses that road who lives in the city of Toronto pays property Everything tax. Everything is funded by property tax. Yes. Uh, well, we, we understand that. But the, the cars that are on the road, uh, they're licensed. The motorcycles that are on the road, they're licensed. And the only thing that's free on those roads uh, are, are bicycles. Am I accurate? And, and pedestrians, obviously. Uh, yeah, through the chair, again, these are the, the charges you're asking for would be provincial licensing. Um, and things like gas tax, again, don't come to the city of Toronto. So I've noticed that since we have, uh, this is just my observation, it hasn't been studied, I'm not an expert, uh, but it's a, gut, it's a gut feeling of mine. Uh, since we've built out some of these uh, uh, infrastructure uh, on our roads, I've noticed that the cyclists actually don't adhere to the rules of the road 
uh, even more. In other words, when there's a red light, they just scoot right through it. Uh, when there are pedestrians, they really don't care. They, they, there's, there's an accident, there's accidents waiting to happen with pedestrians. Uh, we're now wanting to p spend more money uh, for a 10-year plan to build more of these things knowing that cyclists do not pay attention to the your, rules of the road, in fact, break, question, break the, uh, the Traffic Act. And your uh, question? <clears throat> Through the Can chair. we not be making more money by giving them tickets and that going to your particular cause as well? I'm trying to find other mechanisms uh, uh, to, help, to help cushion your particular uh, uh, requests. Uh, th through the chair, I think that there's probably bad behavior from all road users that we see. I watch this each and every day. Um, drivers routinely ignore the law. Some cyclists ignore the law. Pedestrians, some of them ignore the law as well. Totally agree. Yeah, um, so I, I agree. The difference between the, the cars and the, and the motorcycles is they're licensed and it's easier to give them a ticket, right? Uh, you can't really give a cyclist a ticket if they're not licensed and if you can't, if you can't, if you can't really send the ticket somewhere. Right, so, so, uh, you we're, we're we're you're lumping it into everything else that's licensed, right? So I'm suggesting a mechanism here uh, that would bring you revenue, that would help deal with uh, with the enforcement part of those that don't care, and I think that's the majority of these uh, cyclists, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, is it not possible to create a system like this? Uh, through the chair, we, we uh, That's actually your last question. council has asked uh, staff, I think, on four separate occasions. Uh, it was deemed at each time that it would not be an effective route. Uh, council would be no different than right now. Um, you could you could issue fines to a cyclist just the way you could for a pedestrian for jaywalking. Um, the police have the right to ask for a form of ID, um, and you may not perhaps have a driver's license, but they are permitted to ask for a form of ID. Okay, thank you. Councilor Wong Tan. Oh, sorry. I, I apologize. I apologize. Councillor Robinson. I'm not in a hurry. Councillor Robinson. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I have a, a few questions for you. Um, you talk about the 56 million over 10 years, but what's the total amount? Is it closer to 153 million? Uh, through the chair, it is. The, the, the figure that's shown in the report, I believe, is 153.5. Hundred, so we're going to be dedicating $153.5 million over the next tier 10 years in Toronto to, to bike infrastructure. Through the chair, that is, that, that is the proposal. Okay. Just to be clear, because I think there's uh, lots of numbers floating around. And uh, the road safety plan is coming to Public Works and Infrastructure this month. We're very excited about that. Um, that's really focusing on vulnerable users across the city. Will that also uh, aid and help and support uh, cyclists in the city? Yes, uh, through the chair. Again, uh, many of the things that would be incorporated within the 10-year cycling plan um, would be elements that could, could have been put as standalone in the, the road user safety plan. Um, again, they're just sort of in different reports at this point in time, but I think they're all oriented toward achieving the same thing, which is improving uh, road safety for all users. Okay, and then um, I wanted to ask about uh, today, I'm, I'm guessing there might be a few motions on the floor. People, you've created this master plan, you spent hours on it, you've done consultation um, extensively online and in person. H how are you going to react today, I guess, as a, as a transportation team and cyclist uh, unit that have worked very hard on this? If there's all sorts of motions coming forward, putting this in, adding this in, deleting this, pulling, what kind of uh, reaction would you have to that? Or how do you think that would impact the extensive work you've done in consultation? Uh, through the chair, again, we um, tried to be uh, very open uh, with both the councillors and the public about the process and, and consultation. Uh, we think that the plan that we brought forward today uh, builds out an effective network. Um, at this point, we have met with, I think, 30 plus councillors individually about what was proposed for their wards. We have offered uh, briefings for any councillor who requested one. Um, our hope would be that the, the plan itself is adopted as a whole uh, and that it, we don't start sort of tinkering with it. But uh, at the end of the day, as it states in a report, for every one of these projects, there will be some level of community and neighbourhood consultation before their implementation anyway. So um, what we're looking to do here is to try to proactively develop a plan, an implementation plan and a funding plan 
to build out a network. But again, it doesn't mean that the adoption of this by council uh, means that this is going to be implemented without any further consultation, without any additional discussions. Uh, and our hope is that uh, council supports the plan as a whole. So you'd like to move forward as you've uh, developed and delivered this, this initiative, you'd like to move forward as, as, as the piece that is in the report currently? That is correct, and our commitment is to continue to work with the local councillors. Okay, and um, since I have more time, I'll keep asking questions. So um, my understanding is that there's some people in the chamber who aren't comfortable with your recommendation. So you recommended $16 million. And there's some people who feel that eight would suffice because that's also still a, a sizable bite. Uh, why did you recommend the 16 million? Uh, again, over the past few years, the focus has been on, in many cases, uh, the trail system. On the trail system, we can end up spending lots of dollars uh, to basically implement segments that, again, are not necessarily building out a network as quickly as possible. And the goal here is to continue with implementing the trails plan, but also look to build out and enhance the on-street cycling facilities. Okay, and then I've also, um, I guess it's back to your, your answer a minute ago, but I've heard different um, kind of, they're almost rumors about some of the uh, BIAs on various collector roads or arterial roads, uh, the corridor roads that aren't maybe overly keen about um, seeing bicycle infrastructure in their BIAs. How are you going to address that? Because that's, that's a concern for local businesses. Uh, through the chair, as, as any councillor in this room knows, dealing with BIAs can be challenging at times. Uh, there's often not a unified voice. Um, our goal is, though, that we're doing both consultation with BIAs, with other businesses, and providing the public opportunity to weigh in on these. So even if a business perhaps doesn't feel like it's being uh, its position is being recognized through a BIA. Um, we do have public consultation sessions. Again, if they want to come in as a business, if they want to reach out to staff to get additional clarification, uh, we welcome all of that consultation. Okay, and I've got 15 seconds left, and Councillor Campbell's uh, handed me a question to ask you. Can e-bikes and scooters, are they allowed in, in the bike lanes? Uh, through the chair, currently they are allowed in bike lanes. They are not currently permitted in cycle tracks. Okay, thank you very much. You. Councilor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, and through you to staff, I want to just have a better understanding of the uh, the motion that was moved at uh, at the at the committee, whereby they're asking for a uh, procedure to develop a poll uh, to uh, to communicate changes uh, in in road uh, regulations. Uh, can you? Uh, can you, can you tell me how, how large that catchment area might be? Like uh, through the chair, I think that's one of the challenges, Councillor, is um, we probably all have our own opinion about this. I guess one concern is that um, if we're going to go to functionally a referendum style on uh, something like this that can often have a, a larger area-wide or regional impact, um, simply looking at a poll of a small number of individuals, um, we want to factor in their opinion, but it can't necessarily... Uh, it shouldn't necessarily be a uh, deciding factor in terms of whether or not we go ahead with improvements for the transportation system. And so recognizing that there are some areas such as employment areas, I mean downtown Toronto, the financial district, um, our population balloons out four times what it is at, at nighttime. Uh, will the catchment area and the polling also uh, uh, be sent directly to residential addresses individually? Uh, because there's condominiums and, uh, and high-rise towers, or will it also be sent directly to individual uh, business and, and permit holders, not just the office uh, tower owners? Who's being notified in the polls? Yeah. Uh, through the chair, again, in our supplemental report, um, we do have some concerns about polling. Again, for all the, the, the items you identified, uh, making sure that we reach out to the adequate number of people. In certain corridors, you literally may have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that we would need to, to poll. For instance, Richmond and Adelaide, if we had to pull every business and area and resident within a, say, two or 300 meters north and south of there, um, you could literally be looking at something that would be a polling exercise that would entail several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And again, um, what we're hoping to do is capture a lot of the feedback that will be conveyed through there through a consultation process as opposed to polling. And what happens if we, uh, if, if council decides to, uh, to, to uh, adopt the, um, uh, the, the procedure of polling? Uh, how would you manage the uh, the data that will come in if the data does come in? Sometimes polling doesn't give you the results. Uh, and what would those uh, where would the budget come from? Uh, typically, polling is handled by the clerk's office. 
Uh, and so they would basically be the holders of all the information. Um, the, the bigger issue is it would likely uh, cannibalize some of the funding that we have before us on the table here. So it's going to add to the cost of the, uh, the study and design portion of a project. And I just want to understand that uh, with respect to the recommendations that came out of um, the committee, some of it was to literally just sort of slow down uh, the work on, on major corridors. Uh, we have uh, significant work underway uh, for Young Street, revi revitalizing Young. Uh, it's slated for the 2016 work plan. We're getting ready to tender out. Is this, uh, was, will the recommendations from the committee affect that work? Uh, it would not. There's, there's sort of three, three years underway. Uh, Lord DuPont area. Uh, I'll, I'll say Lower Young and then also uh, North York Young Street are the ones that are currently underway um, that the motion at PWIC I don't think would impact. It's basically saying anything beyond that, um, basically not even to cancel but to put a pause on it until we come back and revisit it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to um the transportation folks, I heard you say that there's about 2.5% that use our roads uh, over the year type of thing. Uh, through the chair, that is a number that was again estimated in the early 2010s. So. Can you please also tell me what percentage of the road surface um, bike lanes are taking up right now? Uh, typically in most situations they're taking up um, on the streets that they're actually on, uh, which is only again about uh, 100 plus center line miles, they're often taken up maybe the equivalent of a, a half to a full lane of traffic. So percentage wise. percentage wise of the overall network, you're probably looking at 1%, half percent, if that. Might even be a quarter percent. They're all concentrated mostly in the older city of Toronto downtown area. Uh, through the chair, we, are, we do see the highest concentration there, but we also are starting to see uh, pockets of it around other centers such as North York. In the old downtown, through the chair, in the old downtown area, uh, what percentage of cars would you be uh, putting on the road? In the downtown core? Yes, please. Um, I guess in a downtown core, and, and as an example, Councillor, again, I'm using generalized information. West of the downtown, some of the neighborhoods in that area, uh, we see mode share for cyclists in the range of 11 to 15 yep. percent. So, um, so in, and uh, uh, I'll say west of Spadina out to, say, uh, Dufferin in that area, uh, you're looking at a, a percentage of population commuting, that's primarily a commute, um, of 11 to 15 percent. So a large number um, of travelers are using that. We've seen if a, if a motorist, a driver, driving a car does something wrong, the police automatically give tickets. Yep. Um, they're able to uh, give chase if need be yes. and, and enforce the law. We also see a lot of bikers uh, that actually break the law on a, on, on a daily basis. Uh, would you be able to sort of tell us the amount of tickets that they might be getting? Uh, through the chair, I don't know off the top of my head, Councillor, or we could get that information for you. Um, the police have conveyed to us that they do, um, they do enforcement for cyclists as well. And as one of the initiatives that we've launched as part of congestion management, um, the traffic assistance personnel pilot that we're going to be launching next week, one of the key purposes is not only to direct traffic and manage bad behavior of motorists, but in most intersections we're going to have two police officers, and one is to sort of manage uh, both bad behavior from pedestrians and cyclists as well. So the intent here is that I think our goal was to elevate the conversation and get everyone behaving better on our roads. I, as a driver, have to have insurance, have to have training, have to have a license, and my car has to be plated. If I was to be a bicycle rider, I'm not sure if I insurance is a factor and I'm not sure if I, I need to get insurance. I don't need to get training and my bicycle will not need to get, be plated. Is hence there... The, um, hence the attraction of cyclists. And my colleague says, hence the attraction of cyclists and I would, I would ask him if he would like to cycle in from... Uh, okay, um, can you just ask... My question through the chair is, um, would you advise us that this might be something that we would like to take up with the province? Again, uh, we've looked at it on four separate occasions at the direction of council. Each time it was deemed to not necessarily be an effective uh, idea. Um, I'll, to be honest with you, I, the bigger issue I have right now is e-bikes. E-bikes, you don't need insurance. You don't need to be licensed. Um, and those uh, often weigh several hundred pounds and can go 30 kilometers plus. Um, 
Again, there's classes of vehicles that have been defined under the provincial law um, that is not necessarily under our control that we must live with. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we've, we would probably identify them as more of a threat right now than um, cyclists. Well, I mean, will there be an e-bike that's traveling on a bicycle lane, which I've seen some. Um, and they're permitted currently. And or on the sidewalk, because a lot of cyclists go on the sidewalk. Uh, I think that this is something that we might want to make sure that we uh, look at and ask the uh, the uh, general manager to sort of write to the province and say, okay, what are you doing about it? Because I don't think this is only a problem in the city of Toronto. It's a problem throughout the province. And, I, and we're trying to get to grasp with it, but in the rest of the province they're not. So what would you suggest that we do? Would, would you agree with me that we need to get in touch with the province and say, look, number one, you got to legislate e-bikes, and number two, you got to look to see how we legislate the bicycles? Uh, through the chair, I, I guess the, the first thing I'd ask is, what is the issue we're trying to solve? And, I, and if I heard you right, I think you're saying that you believe there's bad behavior from cyclists. Um, again, my first reaction to that would be that we should try to use existing tools under our control so the police do have the ability to do more active enforcement. I think there's steps we can take in terms of improving education. But again, uh, a lot of our initiative in transportation services around safety is about trying to get all road users to behave better. Unless you hurt somebody in the pocket, I don't think they will change their mind. But thank you. Works. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, um, through you, uh, Madam Speaker, to Mr. Buckley, you, you've uh, fielded some questions this morning uh, about, uh, uh, indeed, I think from the Chair of Works, in fact, um, uh, would this be tough on businesses? And I'm wondering if you're familiar with Jeanette Sadik Khan's actual uh, third party study with methodology disclosed and all of the economic benefits of sustainable streets, including cycling infrastructure. Uh, through the Chair, I am uh, familiar with the work. So that so the PDF that anyone can get on a website shows such things, and these are technical third-party studies, such improvements in retail business the first year, the second year, and the third year of as much as 102 percent in retail sales, uh, starting at 39 percent and going up to 102. Sometimes where there was a lot of activity already, like a like a Bloor Street or a Danforth. It went up 39% and then leveled off, but always it's higher. It's always higher when you put in cycling infrastructure. You're familiar with that data? Uh, through the chair, I am familiar with those studies. And do BIAs in, in Toronto uh, uh, look at that data? Do we share that with them? Uh, through the chair, uh, my experience has been many businesses have their uh, own perception of what drives their business. Um, sometimes I would say I agree with them and sometimes I would say I wouldn't. Um, and I think that there probably is a perception that uh, much of their business comes from vehicular traffic, which in many commercial corridors, um, it's probably uh, a, a much smaller share than, than even they um, acknowledge. Right. And so would there be benefit in us so at some point over the years funding a study like this? Or is there enough technical data from, from, from sister cities and like cities and enough anecdotal data right here in the city of Toronto that, that this is money we don't need to spend anymore? We just know that cycling infrastructure often is not, if not always, improves retail sales and business uh, vitality. Uh, through the chair, I, I, uh, currently we are actually working with ec economic development to look at ways that we, we can develop a similar model. Again, a lot of it, uh, I know particularly in New York City, they have very, uh, very detailed tax records for each individual business, yes. which is something that I think is a greater challenge here in Toronto. Um, so we're, we're looking at working with ECDEV to see if we can come up with a methodology to be able to tease some of this out. Right. It's the fact that the, the cities that have the best technical data are those that have a municipal sales tax. We don't have the pathway of a municipal sales tax to gather the data, but we have enough anecdotal data from BIA areas where we have introduced cycling infrastructure, and we have enough technical data from, from cities with municipal sales tax to study that are very similar to ourselves, Chicago, Brooklyn, etc. Is that the case? Uh, yes. Again, um, it's always important to come up with a good methodology, a sound methodology, um, as so we're not dealing with anecdote. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Cho. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you. Uh, I was in uh, Houston, Texas. So many cars, but I could hardly see anybody bicycling. Uh, bicycling. Uh, and yet in European countries, especially Copenhagen, almost everybody rides bicycle. 
Do we have any kind of study done? Uh, the, uh, I'm asking about the health issue, the life uh, longevity, uh, people riding cars and the people use the bicycle, any life uh, longevity study done? Uh, through the chair, uh, typically uh, the conventional wisdom is that uh, folks who participate in an active transportation tend to have healthier lifestyles. Um, again, you always want to make sure that there's uh, causation in those studies, but um, again, there's a lot of cultural norms in Houston versus Copenhagen and societal acceptance, so I think a lot of it is very location specific, but I will say Toronto is one of the highest mode shares for cycling um, of large North American cities. Mm -hmm. So there is, seems to be a culture here that um, supports it. So, for example, in Copenhagen, what the proportion, like a percentage, people rely on bicycling? It's 40%. Uh, through, the, through the chair, I, I believe the number is in the range of 30 to 40%. 40, 40%. Yeah. And Toronto at the present time? Right now, we're, it was 2.3, I think, in 2011. We expect that it's probably a little higher than that now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Day three. Uh, hoping to get out by lunch. Um, I just had some questions about licensing of cyclists. Uh, this comes up all the time, and uh, I just kind of want to get the facts right from the horse's mouth over there. Um, so, do we. Um, have we explored licensing of, that's a compliment. <laughs> Thank you for good looking. <laughs> that's We're all an extreme compliment. Um, and uh, have we looked at licensing of cyclists? Uh, through the chair, again, councils asked us to look at it on four separate occasions. And again, um, I, I, th I think we have to get back to the root question now is what are we trying to accomplish with this? Um, some, with some, it's uh, an enforcement issue. Some, it's accountability. Some, it's revenue generation. But um, ultimately, uh, I think fundamentally, you have to ask what is it you're trying to achieve? And do we have tools available right now to address some of those concerns? So I think what, um, what people are trying to achieve is that um, uh, kind of equality and if you're getting a ticket for an infraction in a card to give a ticket uh, for an infraction on a bike but I think we do that we do please do that already without licensing uh, through the chair yes they can and they've, they've acknowledged to us that they do do cycling enforcement now again um, we probably can all point to situations where there's not enough enforcement about red light running or stop sign rolling or um, jaywalking. Um, so the police obviously don't have unlimited resources, uh, but what we try to do is first and foremost raise awareness, uh, gain compliance, uh, and then use sort of ticketing and fines as the tool of last resort. And you feel that works sufficiently now? Um, I, I think we can do a better job on the education and awareness side. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Robinson to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I do have a motion if the clerks would kindly put it up. Firstly, I'd like to just commence by uh, commending our, our staff uh, for their work in developing this comprehensive network plan. Uh, they've worked extensively on it. They've worked with the uh, cycling community. They've worked with uh, residents across the city. And uh, it's been a huge effort. So uh, my, my uh, thanks to the whole transportation team uh, for your efforts and work on this. And uh, really, this has been uh, since tw 20, 2001, the city's been working very hard to expand its cycling network. And if you don't know, currently we have 558 lanes, uh, kilometers of on-street infrastructure, including cycle tracks, white bike lanes, counterflow lanes, sharrows, and, and signed routes. So we are making traction. And now we have this long-term plan that's focused on creating a connected, I emphasize a connected network, not a one-off, piecemeal approach. So hallelujah for that, because we've all been waiting for that for years, to have a connected network that really cleans up the gaps in the system and is not piecemeal. And what's before us today is actually going to double the amount of cycling infrastructure and double our annual invest investment. So I'm going to repeat that. What's before us today is going to double the amount of cycling infrastructure 
and double our annual investment. And the grand total will be $153.5 million that will be spent over the next, over the next 10 years. So the motion, the motion's up on the, did people see the motion? Yes. Okay. Councillor McMahon was worried people didn't see the motion, but it was up there. So, uh, but I have to emphasize here that expanding cycling infrastructure is not easy logistically. Our streets are shared spaces. We have to balance many priorities, including diverse road users, cyclists, pedestrians, and motorists, as well as accessibility, uh, volume, safety, transit, and the movement of goods and services, just to name a few. So all of this requires detailed study, detailed analysis, and detailed planning. And, and that's why uh, we're putting significant investment into the three major corridor studies that we're doing this year that Council's already approved. We've allocated over $3 million to the two young studies, the one up at Finch and Shepherd and the other one at, uh, uh, at near Front Street. And we're spending $1.5 million on the Bloor du uh, DuPont study which includes the, the very famous, now famous, Bloor Pilot Project. So we'll be able to gather and fully review the data, which will be very useful as we look at major corridors down the line. And like many of you, I'm a big proponent of bundling those projects at, at City Hall so we can really save time, save resources. It's the most effective and efficient way of conducting our operations. And that's why in this motion before you, you will see that I'm requesting transportation services work with city planning to consider the cycling infrastructure as part of the ongoing Danforth Avenue planning study. City staff, as you can read in the preliminary report also on today's agenda, are also conducting a full-scale review of the character, built form and public realm of Danforth between Coxwell and Victoria Park. And so we need to look at this together and the cycling infrastructure and the integrated and integrate that with the planning study. So uh, I'm ho hopeful that will be approved today, this motion I've got before you. And also the findings of the Bloor Street pilot project, I can't emphasize that enough. The findings from that will really inform how we move forward on those corridor studies. So um, I just again, I want to uh, thank staff for their efforts, uh, for their effective coordination. And if, you, uh, if you've read the report, they're really working very hard on bundling what the, the t over the 10 years, bundling that with the works happening in our neighborhoods and our communities. So I hope you'll support my motion. I also just want to uh, give a quick shout out to Councillor Frakadakis, who's worked on a motion, and she'll be putting that forward next, that I fully support because it really looks at reviewing all aspects of the logistics of uh, putting in bike lanes. As I said, it's very challenging, it's not easy, but um, she's got a great motion that will uh, ask staff to review all those aspects of the logistics of putting in bike lanes. Thank you. We do have questions for you. Councillor Fragadakis, three minutes clarification. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Councillor Robinson, would you consider it a friendly amendment if we added the words... So, excuse, oh, excuse me, Councillor Mahavik, I'm actually asking a question, if you don't mind. Um, sorry, Councillor Robinson, if you would consider a friendly amendment to your motion um, with the words so that they might inform one another, and, and from by that I mean the major corridor study um, uh, and the Danforth Avenue planning study, so that... I would definitely be happy to, uh, to uh, uh, accommodate that request. I think that's a good addition to this motion. And I guess I would just ask you uh, why you would think that that's important. Well, so I was just going to ask you, since I'm asking the questions, <laughs> if you would agree that oftentimes in the city we have uh, divisions working um, parallel to each other and never converging. And, and, and I'm hoping, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. The silo effect, I like to call it. Yes, so that, this is actually, to, just to be clear, so that they actually uh, work together and inform one another so that we actually have a, a, a better outcome. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that, and I think that's a, that's a good uh, addition to this motion, so I would happily add that in. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Th thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Councillor McMahon. Uh, Questions? Speaking of friendly amendments, um, so we just, we had talked about, um, and your motion's not up there, but maybe it could go up. Um, we talked about the third quarter 
of 2017 for having a timeline on there. <coughs> so after the Bloor. Yeah, I think uh, that's actually, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that was uh, the, the, in the report originally. That was the timeline that was identified. Can we just have clarification of that just so we're sure? Because I'm, I'm sure staff are going to be very uh, prompt and efficient and competent as they usually are about bringing back the Bloor bike lane um, uh, results. And, um, we, but we, we just kind of, it would be, it'd be helpful and, and important and key to have a, a timeline date on that, like third quarter of 2017, which I think staff were fine with. Now I see some head nods over there. So I'm, I'm happy to put that in because okay. it's actually in the report. Thank you. Um, so Thank you. if that gives you, I know you're yes. very passionate about this issue, Councillor McMahon. Can you tell? So I'm, yeah, I've known that for actually two weeks uh, of my <laughs> life. Long has weeks. been responding to your texts and phone calls. So um, I'd be happy to put that in, but it is, it, it is in, embedded in the report as well. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Councillor Davis, question clarification of the motion. I, I too just want some assurance that we're talking about actually the fourth quarter. Uh, Councillor uh, McMahon, I'm sure, means the fourth quarter of 2017 because the bike lane study will not be finished uh, until September. So as long as the. And maybe I can just. No, Councillor Davis, you're asking questions to Councillor I Robinson. am, and I'm just looking for a nod. The, if, well, can Council we McMahon. please. Would you agree to putting in a date so we're yeah, clear? We've just, uh, yes, so um, okay. I'm happy to do that. It was already in the report. We took it out at Public Works. We're putting it back in as it was uh, outlined in the report. So, yes, absolutely. I've just, I've just indicated that to Councillor McMahon, so I'm happy to. Thank you. Councillor Cressy. Clarification of the motion. Just a bit. Yes, thank you. So, could you could you just explain to me why you would tie the Danforth study and the report timeline to the Bloor pilot when they're different streets, different road widths? Um, well, we're not really tying it. What we're saying is that uh, it's already. This is how it was proposed by city staff. So this motion is really going back. We, I, I may not be aware, but at Public Works, we pulled this out. So we're putting it back in. We're not really tying it. What we're saying is that this, the results and the information that come out of the Bloor uh, bike lane study should be informative to, as we move forward with any of the corridor studies, I think it's going to tell a story one way or the other. And uh, so that's why we're indicating that this would happen afterward. But like I said, we're not really varying from what staff recommended originally. Well, but the recommendation here, which is to consider the Danforth study at the same time as the findings of the Bloor Street West pilot bike lane, those are very different context. Why, how would a study on a narrower 2.4 kilometer stretch on Bloor inform a study for a much wider road width on Danforth? So, um, the corridor studies, um, there's many who feel that we, you know, the, bi the like I said, all eyes, I've said this many times, all eyes are on the, the Bloor bike lane project uh, that's being rolled out. I know they're doing the, the, some of the um, baseline studies currently, and they're hoping to get those in in August, if not earlier, uh, depending on how some of the other construction goes. So uh, because the, you're absolutely right, they're different contexts, but at the same time, they're major corridor streets in our city, and we're hoping the findings from that uh, pilot project will help inform what we do on our major arterial roads across Toronto over the next 10 years. Okay. So then, in, in, when I heard Councillor McMahon um, in questioning with you, was the recommendation there as a friendly amendment that this would be would take place in the third quarter of next year so what we're just doing is going going back to what was originally in the staff report so at public works and infrastructure we pulled this out yeah, but, but and I, we're putting it back in and so yes the answer to answer your question yes okay so but also it's going back to what staff recommended what, originally the what, timelines but when staff originally recommended it they did not recommend 
having the major corridor study on Danforth at the exact same time as the findings of the Bloor pilot. So I don't think it's fair to say that that's what staff originally recommended. But if I could come back to that, if the intention is to have the Bloor Street pilot inform this, by bringing it back in the third quarter, we won't have a full year of data on the Bloor pilot. So we would, be, we would actually be doing that at a time when we have insufficient data from key months on Bloor. So that, that was your last question. Are you suggesting delaying the, delaying the timeline? Like you are, I'm just in, uh, you're... That yeah. to tie the two together based on the timeline you're proposing. Okay, Councillor Cressy. Okay. Thank you. It's, well, maybe you should talk to staff. Councillor Fragadakis to speak. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a motion if the staff could put it on the screen. And it's that uh, City Council direct the General Manager Transportation Services to evaluate complete street initiatives as part of the Danforth Major Corridor Study such that needs of all users of Danforth Avenue, including cyclists, pedestrians, motorists, transit users, seniors, people with mobility issues, and local businesses are considered. So this motion looks at street design from the perspective of all users. Cyclists, pedestrians, seniors, people with mobility issues, families with strollers, transit users, residents, merchants. Um, there's like trees, patios on the street, on the sidewalks, there's uh, um, benches, er everything and everyone. I know that uh, planning and transportation have done great work on these uh, complete streets initiatives and I think this is how we build sustainable cities. I think this is actually the way of the future. Sorry, um, I can't hear myself. Just quite loud here. What's happening here? There, there's an awful lot of noise. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, I wanted just to read a quote from Jeanette Sadik Khan who said that streets are the front yards for city dwellers and the quality of a street and the variety of its uses relate directly to its livability for everybody. There is something fundamentally ennobling about a street design that elevates its people, even and especially those on foot. Jane Jacobs said it best, sidewalk contexts are the small change from which a city's wealth of public life may grow. Investing in safe, diverse, and walkable streets is an investment in communities and helps make neighborhoods worth living in. Um, so my motion is to make sure that that kind of thinking is part of the equation for the Danforth. And it's important that we do this on the Danforth. It's important to me personally because I actually grew up in this neighborhood. Um, and my parents are, walk on the street every single day. Um, and for me, it's not just a corridor. It's, it's actually a community, and I want to treat it as such. Um, it's where my community comes to congregate, to learn, to share, to worship, to celebrate. And I think that if we use Complete Streets Lens, um, we're actually going to get better neighborhoods. I think that if we get these two studies to work in tandem as best as our sta talented staff can pull off, I think we'll get a better study and I ask you to support my motion. I know that many here um, will agree that, uh, that there are silos um, here with the different divisions and, and often they, they work um, parallel to each other and often they don't converge um, and sometimes unfortunately they diverge and I'm actually looking uh, for something that um, actually better informs um, this study um, and I, I look forward to uh, the outcome of it because I think that our residents often look at uh, what we're doing and it doesn't make sense to them and it frustrates them and it undermines our ability to serve them and we're here to serve them and we should always be looking for better ways to do that and, and to consult with them more effectively and I think that in, in having these two things happen in tandem um, and informing each other I think that we will actually get that result. Thank you. Councillor Mahavik to speak. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Sorry, folks. Uh, I'm going to need the screen there in a second. Uh, that, that thing there. Uh, I have two motions. Uh, one is uh, in 2018, there is a review process happening, and I'm asking for your support to ask request staff to include a strategy for funding and implementing the Eglinton uh, Crosstown Bikeway. That will be a report back in 2018. Uh, when, uh, when Metrolinx finishes its Eglinton Crosstown, uh, we should be looking to be majorly completed or well underway with our bikeway along Eglinton, uh, which is already an approved project, but an unfunded project, so we need to figure that piece out. And the second <coughs> one is uh, to uh, see in this process of uh, federal uh, infrastructure spending, 
not impacting the TTC. Uh, I put that in uh, so that it doesn't uh, conflict with that. But if there is any uh, shekels that are devoted to public, uh, sorry, to active transportation, that we make a play for them as well, uh, so that we maximize uh, maximize uh, the cycling infrastructure, and perhaps then don't need to draw in future years as much on on uh, city hall uh, coffers. Um, having said all of that, uh, let me say, of course, I am. I am, I think as many of us here are delighted that our base budget is going from $8 million to $16 million. That is, that is good, you know, I'm happy with that, of course I'm happy with that, but I think uh, we, need to, we need to really do a good environmental scan of, of what the need is out there and whether we are addressing that need. And I, I would say that when you're looking at best practices of what's happening around the world, when you look at the kinds of changes that are happening in, in transportation or mobility, mobility in, Toron in Toronto, that we really need to pick up our game even beyond what we're doing uh, now. And I'll just uh, show you some pieces if I can take it to the mic here. Yeah. Uh, this is from the Transportation Department's uh, report. <laughs> Uh, the key thing that uh, needs to be noted here is, is that the last time we did a multi-year plan, look at the blue thing, we, we, uh, our goal was 495 kilometers and we did 249 uh, kilometers. So we did half of what we expected to do uh, with the, with the uh, last, uh, last plan. So we're behind. We're already approaching this game uh, behind. Uh, when you look at um, what other cities are doing, let's say in uh, North America, this, this is some very important data here. Montreal, they spend, they are currently spending $9.70 per person. Vancouver is spending $45 per person. And Seattle, just south of there, an American comparable, is $22 per person. When we, what we're spending now is just over $3 a person. And when we finish with uh, this $16 million spend, we will be up to basically uh, six, six and a half uh, ish dollars uh, per person. So we're, we're not in North American standards. Uh, we need to uh, see this really as phase one, and phase two has to be, in 2018, has to be stronger. This is, this is really the A standard globally. Amsterdam, 25 euros, that would be about $40, $45 per person. Stockholm is something like uh, $18 a person. Uh, Copenhagen is uh, something like uh, uh, $40 a person. Those, those uh, communities, of course, have major, major modal shares of uh, the way transit happens in their urban cores, uh, and not just their urban cores, their cities at large, uh, that, are, that is done uh, by, uh, by cycling. That should be really our aspirational goal, is to, is to, is to, find, uh, is to find a way uh, to get to, to those uh, levels. What is it in New York? Uh, Madam Speaker, I think some of this debate is, and this, is, this will be my last point, when you look downtown and when you see streets like College Street, Harvard Street, where there are as many cyclists as cars, you notice that, you, you can't but notice there is, a, there is somewhat of a revolution happening down, downtown. It is different in the suburbs. And I think you're going, going to find very, very strong support for these initiatives in the downtown area. It's because we feel it. Our residents are demanding it. I know of two people in my community, one I used to be his scout, leaders that, uh, scout leader who, who died in a bicycle, uh, bicycle accident. We need to figure this out and we need to basically up our game. And some of it, I think the suburban councillors need to understand the kinds of pressures that we are feeling uh, in, the, in the more uh, inner city. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Councillor Mahevic. Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I have uh, three motions to present, um, and I'm going to paraphrase them because they're lengthy. That's uh, motion A, thank you. Um, so to paraphrase this, this is to uh, move the existing funding level. It adopts the plan, but it moves the existing funding level as was articulated in uh, the report from the general manager. And to be very clear, it's $8 million, which is the existing funding level. I could have the next motion. 
uh, motion B. Uh, so motion B is uh, looks at the supplemental report and in the column uh, a number of projects are identified as those having some traffic lanes impacted and I've identified those in this motion request that those be removed from the plan. I'll present my third motion which is motion C and this motion is requesting a report back from the general manager to PWIC which examines the notion of a permit, a license, or a registration for bicycles as a means to generate revenue, to gather ridership data, uh, to increase health and safety awareness, and to promote the city cycling app, and contains a number of requests to look at uh, about how it could be implemented, who it could be partnered with, and the information that it could gather. So I, uh, I want to point out, talk a little bit about Motion A. Uh, uh, just a sec, Councillor Holliday. Before you continue, um, your last motion as far as licensing, that is out of order because it's not before us. If you would like to bring that forward at a later date at the committee or at licensing, then it would be discussed at that time. So I'll have to rule that, that one out of order. Okay. Thank okay. you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, with respect to Motion A, look, I don't know if councillors in this chamber were listening to the city manager when he painted a fiscal picture about this city but I don't see how we can be cutting checks that we can't cash. So the, the other scenarios talk about increasing uh, spending beyond what we've got today. And I think it's just false to stand here and pretend to implement a plan where we don't actually have a financial plan to implement it. Motion A, just it doesn't take away from what's on the list. I think staff have done a wonderful job of going through a process to identify necessary uh, cycling infrastructure projects and submit them on a prioritized list. Whether or not I agree with the individual projects is a different story, but this is very much about the throttle at which we implement it. And it, what it really boils down to is the amount of funding that we allocate to, this, to the projects determines how quickly they're implemented, not if they're going to be implemented. They will over time. But simply taking a very responsible approach, knowing the fiscal situation that we're in, I have no problem with sustaining current levels. And this notion that nothing is being built today, there's lanes going in all over the place using the existing budget. One alarming comment I did hear in the question is that the general manager said that perhaps they would look at other parts of the existing budget to fund that extra $8 million. Well, I'll remind councillors, I know that I certainly do get requests to repair sidewalks, to fill potholes, to repave roads as quickly as possible. And by taking funding away from that type of work, it, that, that's the same environment that the pedestrians and the cyclists do use. So I'm not sure that's a wise trade and uh, I, we can count on continued phone calls complaining about those sorts of things. With respect to Motion B, uh, I've simply identified those which have the, the largest impact to live lanes. And essentially what that says to me is that some traffic lane impacts means that we're going to have to close traffic lanes to implement these, these, uh, these pieces of bicycle infrastructure. I don't know, I think somebody needs to stand up for drivers in this city. And I don't think it's a, it's a fair trade in many of the instances where the drivers still categorically outnumber the number of cyclists. And what these are, these create bottlenecks. And it's, uh, this is a very straightforward request to take out of the plan, not everything. There's some great pieces in this plan, some pieces of cycling infrastructure that make a lot of sense. But I would like to strike out the ones that uh, have these significant traffic impacts as identified on the chart. I hope you'll uh, make some um, thought to these. Um, I hope you'll think about the future, about when we're going to be out knocking on doors in the campaign and we're going to have residents thanking us for implementing cycling lanes and uh, also residents thanking us for, um, for maybe placing lanes in front of their home and asking their visitors to park around the corner because they can't park in front of their place anymore. And there needs to be some balance in how we implement this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question for you. Councillor Layton, clarification of the motion. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Were any of the list of roads that you deleted from the bike plan in your ward? Um, I'd have to go back and look. No, I don't believe they were. They were taken off of the uh, supplemental report. Did you consult any of the local councillors about what lanes you were deleting from No, the I consulted the uh, supplemental report. Did you consult the local councillors and ask if their residents supported removing those lanes from, uh, uh, from the report? 
Nope, I consulted. So the when employee. you make the statement, when Count, Councillor Layton, please clarification of the motion only. I, I was asking if yeah. a, a, about yes, the and list he of answered, roads and his that. answer was no. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, do you have a point no, of order? The point of order was I'd let councillors need to have an opportunity to answer yeah. questions when they're asked, and not to be interrupted by the person asking the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, did you count local? Did you consult local residents before you uh, you you went ahead and deleted the the, the lanes within the jurisdiction of, of their homes? Uh, no, I used the information provided by staff to make that determination. So no consultation of local residents or the local councillor when determining which lanes could Ca randomly be pulled out of the report. Uh, there's nothing the councillor did local. answer that three times. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank um, you. Just on the uh, on on the eight million dollar question. Um, there was a poll conducted. Are you aware of the poll that was conducted by Angus Reid that demonstrated that even in even within your neighborhood there was uh, support for uh, the removal of lanes, uh, uh, sort of support uh, for uh, the implementation of the lane. Councillor Layton, that's not part of his motion. Please. The statement that was made, though, in support. No, no, of the but you you ask questions on his motion, not on the statements he made. Then would you agree that implementing? Uh, implementing the cycling plan that would make it more predictable for drivers where bikes where bikes would be. I, I, I can't hear a thing, Speaker. Okay. okay. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor, Councillor, yes, Councillor Campbell. Madam Speaker, the members, it would be good to hear from the clerk what what clarification of a motion means. Clarification of a motion does not mean an opportunity to debate the person who's put yeah, forward. Yeah, exactly, and that's what I informed Councillor Layton. Thank you. Councillor Matlow, clarification of the motion. I, I believe that all the councillors know what clarification means. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to ask uh, Councillor Holliday, uh, and by the way, I, I, I respect uh, that, that, he, that he believes he should uh, be a voice for, for drivers in the city. Um, so, uh, with respect to your motion, um, ha have you thought of, I mean, as a fellow driver, I drive too, um, have, have you thought about, um, you know, that challenge that we drivers have when, uh, when a bicyclist is taking up the lane in front of us and we have to slow down to an incredibly frustrating uh, speed uh, uh, while that bicyclist is in front of us. Have you thought of uh, what we can do, perhaps with your motion or otherwise, to uh, help, help we as drivers be able to move along uh, in that lane uh, so that that bicyclist isn't in front of us? Is there, is there somewhere else perhaps? Uh, uh, Councillor Matlow, I don't have a problem with uh, lawful use of lanes, as, as that implies. In fact, I myself have been a cyclist and occupied a lane, and I don't have any difficulty with it. Uh, do, you, do you see that there might be an opportunity, uh, if the width allows and if it's reasonable to move forward, to allow for the bicyclists to have a safe uh, uh, lane uh, uh, that's separated, and well, then those who drive uh, would then uh, be unobstructed uh, on the road. That is an excellent point, and uh, precisely why I crafted this motion, looking at only the projects that have some traffic lanes impacted. There's a, a tremendous majority of cycling projects that remain in this plan that had minimal or no traffic impacts, and those would be the lanes where there's space on the road to implement them. I think that's great. Move forward, move through with the process of consultation, whatever's appropriate in each of the stages, in each of the stages, and go ahead on those types of projects. So, so if I if I hear you correctly, what do are you saying that are you saying that if if there is the uh, the right road width, and if 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 it works to put a separated lane like a safe, a safe separated lane, a bikeway for, uh, for uh, bikes, uh, that you would support that if it's well studied. Uh, and, and, and do you understand my point that as a, as a driver, it would actually be convenient for, for many drivers who sometimes feel inconvenienced when there's a slower vehicle uh, like a bike uh, in, front of when, uh, in front of them when they're driving? Uh, uh, Councillor Matlow, I think the staff have done an excellent job of adding an additional layer of data to the cycling plan where they've listed out a, a tremendous number of projects. And that data uh, articulates those projects which have minimal impact, meaning uh, that, that they're really, they can just paint the lines today, they can go ahead, whether or not they need different layers of approval or consultation, that's fine. There are other projects that might have some slight impacts. 
And those are also identified in the plan. And then there's this, this last category that says some traffic lane impacts. And my interpretation of that means literally that it means removing a lane. And those are the projects that I've circled on this list that I've identified as something I don't think we should be moving forward with right now because they have the largest impact on the drivers. It's all the other ones that had the less impacts or the no impacts. We should just okay, go ahead with them. Thank, thank you. That was it. That was your last question. Thank you. Uh, oh, Deputy Mayor, you had your name on or off? You took it off? Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Menon to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've got a motion. Let City Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services to report to the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee on the possibility of the use of seasonal cycle tracks in, in the fourth quarter of 2016. That's report in the, in the uh, fourth quarter in two, of 2016. Um, so the idea on this particular motion is that uh, I, we all know, I, I mean, the, the, I, I said this before, but it's worth repeating. The thing that drives people crazy is seeing a cycle track where no one's on it and you're stuck in traffic. And, and the proposition is in the winter time, there are way less cyclists uh, who use these cycle tracks. And so if there's, if there's a way in which we can actually increase the road capacity during the winter time when no one is using this space, then perhaps we should look at that. So in the middle of the winter time, are there places where we have cycle tracks that won't be used and should we take them out so that uh, it could be used for other purposes? Um, so generally speaking to the report, um, so I, I support the committee recommendations uh, not to move forward with Young Street. Uh, there is a motion forward to, to, in some sort of way, not make a decision on the Danforth right now. So I can tell you that, 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 that I, in the last term of council, was the, I think it's fair to say, the architect of putting in the first, first uh, uh, separated cycling network in the downtown core. I'm not opposed to having separated bike lanes, but I am opposed to having them on major arterial roads where, uh, where they're, 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 they, they conflict on, on traffic coming in and out of the city. Um, I am hoping that if, this, if Danforth does come back, I am hoping that it comes back and there is a pilot project in 2018. And you know why I'm hoping that? I'm hoping that because then it will become an election issue. I've seen a letter from a number of councillors in that area saying that they support these, these, uh, these uh, bike lanes on, on the Danforth. And I can tell you from direct conversations that I've had from <coughs> business owners in the BIA that they are apoplectic about the idea of putting separated bike lanes on the Danforth. You know, there are all sorts of people and government always likes to tell business what's good for them. Oh, you know you're going to get more business. Oh, of course, you should trust us because we know how to run a business better than you do. And you have businesses that have been there for decades, and they've actually carefully built up their business. And I don't know about you, I've gone down to the Danforth from time to time for dinner on a, on a weekend. I don't go as much now as I used to. Uh, but I can tell you that it's tough to get there. There's Parking is rammed up and down the street, both sides of the road. We've got green pea parking there, but you've got, to, you've got to park on the side streets, and sometimes you have to walk blocks and blocks and blocks. And what does, this, what does the Danforth proposal suggest? The Danforth, the Danforth proposal suggests that we make it even worse for these businesses because we're, we're going to tell them that their customers and their patrons have to walk even further. But people on this council think that's clever and wise, and that's actually by making them making it more inconvenient to patronize these businesses that they're going to want to, that more people will want to come to be more inconvenienced. Now, where is the logic in that? I, uh, you know, uh, if we're going to build a, a cycling network, I'm all in favor of the connections. But in terms of putting it on the Danforth, I think it it makes no sense at all, and I think most of the businesses on the Danforth know that. And, when the, and if this motion passes and it comes back uh, whenever it does, that, uh, that, that, that we should defeat it at that point in time. Thank you. We do have some questions for you. Councillor Holliday, clarification of the motion. Uh, Deputy Mayor, are you, uh, are you aware that there was some work done or there's some discussion at PWIC mm -hmm. to look at the costs 
of winter maintenance of cycle tracks. Yes. And that this increased cost, uh, would you see this as, as possibly a, a revenue neutral or a revenue saving or a cost saving measure because I'm sure there's some set up and tear down costs of cycle tracks for seasonality but perhaps there's a significant winter cost of maintaining them and there might be some savings in not having to maintain them through the winter. You know, I think you're, I think you're right. There could be some sa savings involved. There could be some costs involved. But you know what, uh, Madam Chair, the Transportation Services is $56 million to play with. So, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty flush with money. If, you, if there was some savings, would you be okay in reinvesting those savings into additional cycling infrastructure? Um, you know, uh, Madam Chair, I believe that if we do have, you know, north of $50 million, what I hear from my constituents is they would like more money invested in road repairs and in okay. resurfacing. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Councillor Carroll, clarification of the motion. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I want to clarify what you mean by seasonal because there, there are cities in Canada, we were just in Winnipeg and they have one and they, they do the same in Vancouver where, where they have ones. Are you talking about when you say seasonal, there are some cities where they have removable uh, screw in, screw out bollards, uh, but it doesn't mean that we have to totally redesign the street for the winter. It means that if you see no cyclists for miles around, use your own judgment automobile operators. Is that, is that the type of flexibility you're looking for seasonally? Or were you thinking of a total redesign of the street with different lanes and such come wintertime? Well, I, 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 Madam Chair, I have an open mind toward the consideration of the options that might be available. I, don't, I haven't settled on one particular uh, uh, oh, model. So model. <laughs> Madam, I'm just going to finish. Yeah. So if there are, are, are examples in Winnipeg or Vancouver or some other city, um, you know, I, I think that, that we should look at those models. So I don't have any particular idea in mind. What I, the, the purpose behind my motion, Madam Chair, is this idea, it, it, you know, in, in let's say February when no one's riding, well, except for very few people, maybe there's, a, 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 and, and we have, you know, lots of traffic and congestion, maybe we could open up that space for cars when cyclists aren't using it. Right, but but you're you're not you're not saying realign the lanes simply that the cars be aware they don't see a cyclist so there's a little bit of ease there. You're not suggesting where we where where we have lane reductions for bike lanes that we redesign and 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 flip that lane reduction for the for the year. That that truly I what would I would be what I would like what I would like to see is an arrangement where uh, yeah. if there is if there is a, a flat cycle track. Um, with bollard, with re bo removable bollards, if nobody's using them in the winter time, perhaps we can look at t taking those bollards out and letting uh, letting cars use that that space. And and your comments sort of stretch to you're concerned that uh, uh, you know you want this seasonal improvement, and one of your concerns is that 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 businesses customers can't get to their doors. But you're familiar with the studies that prove that for some reason retail sales go up when you put bike lanes in. There's a street in, in Brooklyn where they went up 505 percent year over year. Well, you're, you're familiar with that, that data? I'm all, Madam Chair, I'm, you know, one can anecdotally pick out whatever. Well, this is a hard third party. I'm sorry, Madam study. Chair, Councilor I would Carol, really like to answer Madam, the question. Madam Speaker, I, there, there was an editorialization of my question. I'm not talking anecdotally. I, I've already mentioned a technical third party study based on municipal now, sales tax. Councillor Carroll, please. I resent the editorialization. Councillor Carroll, please allow the councillor to answer your question, please. Well, but I didn't use the word anecdote, now, so clearly we're leading to not an answer to my question. Okay, please. Madam please. Chair, can I, may I ask? Are you familiar with the study or not? Okay, count. Madam Chair, may I ask you a question? Yes. yes. Can you please answer the question? Well, Thank may you. I ask? Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I, may I get some clarification from the chair? My motion had to do with um, seasonal bike lanes, yes. and I'm wondering uh, whether I, I'm supposed to be answering questions with regard to clarification of that particular exactly. motion. Exactly, and we've said that over and, and over whether, again. And whether her, her question, whether valuable or not, is actually uh, relevant to the motion. It's under. not clarification of your motion. So, Madam Speaker, if I, if, I may, if I may clarify my question, and I, I think I did when I asked it 
during the description of why the, the councillor was moving his motion, he said he was concerned with having this seasonal structure of the bike lane so that customers could get to stores. And I'm trying to clarify what having the bike lane there in the winter or the summer has to do with customers, given that customers are both cyclists and drivers. Okay, councillor Kerr, I believe that the councillor has answered that question. Thank you. Councillor Cho. Councillor Cho. Well, maybe not to your satisfaction. Councillor Cho. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, when I saw this motion, it's great, but uh, if I were the manager of transportation, when we say seasonal cycle tracks, uh, are you referring to four seasons we have in Toronto? Or some years we do have lots of snows, other winters are so warm, it's like almost spring. So what do what, what, what you try to get from this motion? So Ma Madam Chair, obviously the time when, when cyclists are out the most are in the summertime and, and, and in portions of the spring and the fall. The, the, the time, seasonal, and, and, and I'll tell you, Madam Chair, that, that staff helped me write this motion. Um, and the point I want to make is, particularly in the wintertime, there are, you know, ex except for, you know, real enthusiasts like Councillor De Bearmaker, who will, you know, in the worst of weather, he'll get on all his winter gear and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and ride, which is great. But there aren't, I think it's fair to say, there aren't a lot of people like Councillor DeBearmaker. And, and so w when you have these empty, empty uh, cycle tracks and, you know, you're stuck in traffic and you have this big space where, you know, you could, f you could fill it in. Or let's, let's take the example on the Danforth when um, it's the middle of wintertime, right? And in the, in the wintertime, someplace like Greektown, they're not as busy as they are during the summertime, and we'd like to attract and give them business. And they don't want to walk with their families all the way to the restaurant. If there's a space open, if they know that they could park near the restaurant, they would actually maybe go and patronize in, in, the, in those cold months where they wouldn't have, you know, if you had a cycle track in there, they'd have to walk blocks and blocks. What I'm saying is, perhaps in those cold months, there might be some value and utility and merit to studying a, remo a removable cy cycle track. Thank you. I, I believe that you've answered that same question. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mamalidi, to speak. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think the clerk is still just uh, touching up my, my motion. Okay, I'll hold, you, I'll hold it down then. then. Um, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Kelly. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Speaker, I uh, will be supporting the uh, recommendations uh, uh, and the amendments by uh, Councillors Robinson and Deputy Mayor uh, Denzel Menon Wong. Speaker, I'm looking at uh, this issue from uh, or through the lens of uh, economic uh, development. Uh, my colleagues have heard me say and will continue to hear me say that competition in the 21st century is increasingly between urban regions, between cities, and less between countries. And so the City of Toronto, Speaker, and I know you're hanging on every word. Sorry. In this competition between urban regions, between cities, it's really important that the City of Toronto be perceived uh, in a way that attracts people, skilled people, uh, and money from investors that are looking for a place to make that money grow. And increasingly, the characteristic that uh, cities have to display, at least uh, in the, the Western, uh, from a Western perspective, is that of a cool city. And Speaker, the jobs have to be there, numbers of them, and certain types of jobs. But as Richard Florida has pointed out in a number of books, increasingly, young people are choosing the city they want to live in before they choose the company uh, they want to join. or the field they want to create uh, their own company. 
Now, Speaker, my background uh, is suburban. Uh, I grew up uh, in the suburbs, uh, and I grew up within the context of uh, the car culture. But we're living in a changing world, Speaker, uh, and culturally there is now a new norm. And that, that, that norm uh, embraces, among other things, or is characterized increasingly um, by uh, being sensitive to and responding to and creating a favorable environment for cyclists. If you were sending out photographs of the City of Toronto internationally, you wouldn't send out photographs of congestion on the DVP, uh, frankly, or the gardener. You would be sending out photographs of smiling, young or middle-aged cyclists. And because that is the face that you want to present to the world. This is a terrific place in which to live. It's cool. It's, uh, it's directed towards younger people. It's physically uh, an active city. So, Speaker, I think that those are very important considerations that we all have to take uh, uh, in mind when we, uh, take, when we examine uh, the cyclists, uh, the cycle plan, cyclist plan, bike lane plan that is being proposed today. Now, Speaker, as an aside, when we were debating the Uber taxi issue, it was essentially a debate between full-time or close to a taxi drivers and part-time Uber drivers. And what I found interesting was that here was a conflict between two sets of drivers right on the edge of the driverless world. And frankly, looking at, at, this, at the debate we're having today about cars and cyclists, uh, here we are talking about lanes for cyclists, and I suspect within 20 years, maybe even less, these will, will uh, be considered not so much bike lanes, but hover lanes. I don't know if any of you saw the article in the paper about this Quebec entrepreneur who is working on personalized hover platforms. And so, Speaker, although we're talking, we're, the context here is bike lanes and cyclists, I wouldn't be surprised if in the near future what we are going to be creating are the hover lanes of the future. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher to speak. Thank you, Speaker, and I apologize. I was up uh, in a meeting in the members' lounge when you called me earlier. I do have a motion. Okay. There it is there. Uh, undertake updated cycling councils at Dundas East. Uh, work with the councillors and the community to look at improvements, updated line markings, intersection improvements, green markings, and any areas that could be separated. And also, secondly, just to increase the area of study for public consultation period, uh, purposes for the Riverdale neighborhood um, on the cycling plan. And I just want to quickly address uh, really the first big bike lane that we put in here, which was Dundas, which runs from Kingston Road all the way to Broadview. It's very long. It's a great commuter line. It runs through Councillor McMahon's ward and my ward. It's used greatly by uh, people in the neighborhood and from the East End. And yet it always needs a little bit of TLC. For some reason, it doesn't get the TLC it needs. And I'm hoping that in this cycling plan that we can look at it a little bit differently as a major commuter route and upgrade it to that extent. It was a hard fought battle and a great victory to have the Dundas bike lane and Councillor DeBearmaker rides it quite often as he'll tell you. Um, I do want to just note I got a letter here you got it it's PW 13 11 150 and it's from the two young women that were the councillors for the day yesterday. They've written a letter to council to the mayor Saying cycling makes it easier to get to work, takes less time, and is a much more environmentally friendly mode of transport. There are lots of cyclists in our community. Many people also travel to the Danforth 
to visit the stores and also their workplaces. It would be easier for people in the community to access the stores and shops on the Danforth with the bike lane in place. These two young women are the future of our city, the future of our neighbourhoods. They're part of the sophisticated urban fabric that uh, the multimodal society, transit, walking, cars and bikes. There is also a large petition here since the meeting that was held at PWI and I want to thank Councillor Robinson and uh, Councillor Fragadakis and Councillor McMahon, um, Councillor Davis for working very hard to bring back the idea of studying the major corridor along the Danforth because on the Danforth, the Danforth does, does love bikes. It's a broad street in many areas. It's a huge cycling community that goes through there. I invite anybody in the morning to see the packs of people that travel the Danforth and worriedly don't feel as safe as they could. A study of that corridor to see what's possible for commuters, cycling commuters, is very important. A number of months ago, I was at a <coughs> office at a, a business on the Danforth. The owner's very concerned about bike lanes and uh, an older gentleman there used to actually lived in Scarborough said come on it's the way of the future they're building buildings downtown there in that includes cycling infrastructure many offices they're putting showers in the office buildings for people that are commuting every day it is a new way of moving around the city councillor Kelly is right you're not going to show a picture of Toronto without showing some of these great new lanes that exist. And Councillor Min and Wong, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, I always say put all of that infrastructure in in the last term. You can move around the city. Now we have to get people on their bikes moving into the city, cycling safely. Now you can move on Queen's Quay, on Simcoe, on Richmond, on Adelaide, on Dundas. But there's many more ways we need to bring people safely on their bicycles into the city core because they are working there. They are coming here to this part of town. That's the future. That's the big sophisticated city that we're building. Let's make it a safe traveling for everybody in, that's coming into the downtown core in our city. Thank you. Councillor Mamalidi to speak. Your so, name is there. Madam Speaker, I, 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 it's not going to come to a surprise to anyone in the chamber that I just think that we are <laughs> I think that we are not showing any leadership at all around uh, this, this issue uh, on cycling in the city of Toronto. And I think all we're doing is creating headaches for, for the city. And I've said this time and time again, and I'm going to continue to say it. I'm going to continue voting against these kinds of things, because all we're doing is frustrating the city even more. Uh, what's frustrating to me is that motions that are try are, have been attempted to be passed uh, are being said they're out of order. Uh, Councillor Holliday, uh, we have the right idea, I think, that if we're looking to pay for these things and let's find the mechanisms to pay for it. Licensing uh, these, uh, these cyclists in the downtown part of the city and only on uh, main arterial roads is the right thing to do. Uh, and it's the right thing to do for a number of reasons. I'd even go as far as saying them, uh, take them for, for, for lessons before they get their, their, their licensing uh, their, uh, uh, approved because uh, there's a lot of psycho cyclists in the city of Toronto and I think the majority of them are becoming uh, psycho cyclists. And I think all you have to do, take a drive, walk, take a drive along some of these main, uh, main streets that we put these crazy lanes in and you can see that it's not the cars that are going off a little nuts. It's not the pedestrians that are going off a little crazy. And it's certainly not the motorcyclists that are, are, are not driving appropriately and not behaving to the rules of the road. 
but the psychocyclists are. And you can see them because they increase the level of stress to everybody. And if anything, I would argue that they're the ones that are putting everybody at risk. They're not stopping at stoplights. They're weaving in and out of cars. They're making scenarios worse than they could be. And yet everybody wants to blame the car for that particular scenario. And I know that everybody knows what I'm talking about. And I also know that we want to keep ignoring the pleas of the people that use the roads. And I'm going to say it again. War on car. War on car. War on car. Because that's exactly what's going on here. Let's take the car away by squeezing them out. We can all be proud of ourselves for doing that. But what you shouldn't be proud of is making life hectic, stressful, and worrisome for the people who do want to go to work in their car, for, or their motorcycle for that matter, or even walk. The cycle cyclists in this city are making it very dangerous even for the pedestrians. And if you can see what I have seen, perhaps you choose not to, but most of this city sees it. They're weaving around, they're almost hitting the pedestrians, they're almost hitting the, the cars, the motorcyclists, and they're creating a very dangerous scenario in the city of Toronto because they don't know how to ride a bike. And so if we want to do this, if we want to take taxpayers' dollars and we want to put them into cycle lanes, license the darn things, only on main arterial roads and only in the downtown part of the city. I'm not talking about, uh, I know what's going to be written up there tomorrow about Mamma Lady wanting all the cyclists to be licensed. That's not the case. I'm not asking the children to uh, be licensed, none of that. Let's get that out of the way right now. All right, because it's only the downtown part of the city where these lanes would be used. You want to use the lanes, then go to school, like any other person that uses these, these highways have to do. Go for a little course and get yourself licensed, because right now, all I see is cycle cyclists on the road that don't know how to ride the bike. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Perks, please stop interrupting. Are you finished? Yes, but it doesn't mean you have to have an outburst. Come on, we're trying to get through this item. Councillor McMantz to speak. Well, as a non psychocyclist, I will uh, speak to you about my experience on the road and how bike lanes make it easier for everyone, people who drive, people who bike, and be people who walk, it makes it easier for everyone to see where they're supposed to be on the road and to move cooperatively and collaboratively. So why wouldn't we want more bike lanes? Um, as someone who lives two seconds from the Danforth, right in my backyard, walk it, ride it, take the subway underneath because that's another way to get to your shops on the Danforth, not just in a car, uh, Deputy, Deputy Mayor Minamwong. Um, I can see the effect. I can see how wide that road is. I bike it to Sherburn and then come down to City Hall that way. Um, I see the droves of cyclists uh, in rush hour in the morning, especially. And I actually, as I'm cycling safely, obeying the rules, I... Councillor Mamaliti, please. Councillor Mamaliti, I don't think you've ever driven on a road that I've cycled on. And if I were cycling on that road and you're driving on it, I'd sure as hell get the hell off. <laughs> um, so, back okay. to cycling. Yeah. Okay, hold on, hold on. Councillor Mamaliti, when you're speaking and people interrupt, you get angry. You, you do. Yeah. So now, will you stop interrupting other members of council? You feel that we're picking on you. Now you're picking on Councillor McMahon. Okay, yes. Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. So as someone who cycles down the Danny regularly, I actually 
Uh, because I'm on my bike and I'm not in the subway and I'm not in the car, I actually see the shops and businesses more closely. And I think, hey, wouldn't that be a great restaurant to go in and stop in? Wouldn't that be a great shop to stop in? So I would argue, and it has been proven with facts and stats, that cyclists actually spend more over the course of a month than a person in a car. And we can, if you don't believe me, we can get you stats on that. So all that to say, uh, I'd like to thank Chair Robinson for her hard work. It's been long and hard. We've worked well together. And the mayor and city staff, cycling and planning, and Cycle Toronto, Jared Cole, and the East End Councillors for working together to get uh, the Danforth Corridor study back in, in the plan and, and get it going and to coincide it with our Danforth planning study. I'd also like to commend uh, MPP Eleanor McMahon, uh, no relation, unfortunately, um, who was on Metro Morning this morning and is working very hard on Vulnerable Road Users Act, uh, which is, is vital. But, but I think overall, as, as leaders in the city, we want to keep our roads safe. We want to keep our, our, our Torontonians safe, healthy. We want to mitigate congestion. We want to encourage more cyclists to come on the road and, and keep everyone safe. Not, and we're not into the war on cars, the war on bikes. We're talking about people. We're talking about people who drive, people who walk, and people who cycle. And we are just all people trying to get around this city. So let's work together on that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Uh, listen, cycling infrastructure is incredibly important for a city that's growing, for a city of our size. I'm absolutely in support of, of increasing cycling infrastructure, no doubt about that. It's just something we need to invest in. I look at this as a question of how much, and you know, and I'm going to be using my budget hat naturally, but I'm looking at how much should we be investing in the city. And that's what we're debating, I think, discussing right now. We're, the numbers are being thrown around, and we're going to be coming to some sort of uh, agreement. The chair of uh, the committee has uh, mentioned that we're going to be doubling our annual investment. And it sounds great. You know, we're doubling our annual investment in cycling infrastructure in the city. And it could be. Where my frustration lies is month after month committee council meeting we continue to add we continue to add 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 things into our priorities things that we want to do because it's going to make our city better i see it day in and day out and we're doing it right now two days ago we had a plan from our city manager a long-term fiscal plan to really start looking at how do we sort of manage ourselves one of the biggest criticisms, the problems and frustrations he has on his side and staff side is what we're doing right now. We just add with no priority setting, without looking at how we put a plan together to figure out how we pay for it. And I'll, I'll be, I'm on the guilty side as well. I have in the past made decisions to do this, to do that without a proper plan. And I will put that as a member of the council as I'm guilty with that also. But when we're looking at what the city manager has brought us and what we need to do in the future, we need to start getting disciplined in what we're doing. We need a coordinated fiscal plan. It's fundamental to what we need to do moving forward. We all agreed to do that. We've all agreed that this is what we need to do a couple of days ago. We need to start living that. What we're doing right now is we're not living that. We're just kind of doing the add-on, add-on, add-on. We have some serious challenges in 2017. We're going to be talking about, I know we've talked about revenue tools. I'll tell you one thing, whatever we end up doing revenue tools, it ain't going to impact us in 2017. We've got some huge, huge challenges that we're going to have to deal with. How we're going to deal with them? We're going to see in the next couple of months as, as we move forward through the cycle. It was interesting uh, that uh, the director of transportation commented about, you know, it sounded good. Oh, I can get the money from our existing budget. That's great. You know, we don't have to add any more. We can get it from our existing budget. I hear that and I kind of go, you've got to be kidding. You can actually get that money from the existing budget. Does that mean we have extra money 
sitting around to spend on priorities? And is this the priority we want to spend? So I look at that in my hat and kind of go, you know what? Let's put that as a direction out to the system. So if you want anything new, you want new investments, you want to add more priorities into what we want to do, find it within your existing budget. And I actually want to thank the director for that because that is something the whole system should be doing. Let's not add more, let's just look at getting it from within our existing system. So when we add an ad from the priorities at this council, we send it off to, to staff, great. You want to add more? Find it from within your existing budget. Because I have a feeling that's going to be something we're going to have to tackle in the 2017 budget. And I also just want to add on, so we talked about doubling. We talked about uh, it's a $153 million uh, increase over the 10 years. What we haven't looked at and what we never look at as a council is what it's going to cost to do that. What are the debt costs? $400 million a year to service our debt. And I think the, the uh, CFO mentioned that transportation, 70% of our capital projects come from debt servicing. So when we're talking about the extra 100 and, uh, the $153 million over 10 years, add on the cost of the debt. It's like when you have a line of credit, you purchase something, there's going to be a cost to that. If you're going to pay it over 10 years, add the interest cost because that's part of the cost of the investment. We don't do that around here. Everything we do, we never look at how much it's going to cost. We need to start thinking that way as we move forward. Um, so, where we're going to go, where I'm going to be going on this, I'm looking at my fiscal, there's a side of me, I'm going to be supporting uh, Councillor Holidays. Let's invest, but let's invest at the amount we're looking at doing now. And it'll come back when we're looking at our long-term fiscal plan, and if this is a priority that we can afford, if this is something we need to do, I'm there. But we need to look at it as part of an entirety of all of our priorities. This is just one small priority. We have a lot of them around here. We have to stop looking at them one on one on one. We need a fuller plan and we need to stick with it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerjianis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to confess that in my ward, I have a lot of bikers that are going on sidewalks. And I get a lot of calls from elderly um, constituents that are using the sidewalks and they're saying, I almost got run over. So you sort of sit there and you say, okay, let's try to see where we can put these bikes. And I've got a hydro corridor which goes east and west, and that's the hydro corridor, and it parallels McNichol. And a lot of people that are riding on McNichol, instead of getting onto this hydro corridor that has a bike uh, lane that uh, going along and spend millions of dollars to do, they kept on going straight on that uh, sidewalk. And you got children that are coming out of schools at Kennedy and uh, McNichol, and when the cyclist can be on this corridor moving along, he or she chooses not to. I'd appreciate Councillor Perks uh, paying attention. That'd be greatly wow. appreciated. Say something worth listening to. Uh, uh, Councillor Councillor Perks, please, can you apologize? I heard it. From the heart now, from the heart. Councillor Perks, so on the comment that you made, please, can you apologize to the Councillor? Councillor, uh, sorry, Speaker, through you to Councillor Karajanis, I'm quite sorry. Thank you, Mr. Thank Perks. you. Um, and I was approached by city staff and said, we would like to extend this bicycle path between Birchmount to Victoria Park. And I said, fantastic idea, love to do it, love to work with you. And he said, where would you like to put it? Well, we'd like to put it through the hydro corridor. And I said, look, that hydro corridor bicycle path is used maybe by about 20 or 30 people during the day. Can we consider putting this along McNichol on the north side. Well, we're going to give it some consideration, Councillor, and I'm still waiting to hear. I don't mind bicycle paths, but when we take existing streets and chop them up in order to put a bicycle lane that is only used during the summer and then it's not used during the winter, the drivers just get uptight. There is anxiety that gets built. And when you got bicycles, uh, bicycle drivers that jump from lane to lane, on the same street where they got a bicycle lane to go on, on, on the north side, they choose to go on the south side just because it's convenient. Well, you know what? The rest of us that have to have insurance, have to get a driver's license, have to get driver's tra training, are saying to ourselves, why are they not 
also following the same rules and regulations we are. We have to have insurance, and for some of us, insurance can range from anywhere of $1,100, $1,200 a year to about a few thousand dollars a year, maybe five or six thousand dollars per year. So in that case, why is the bicycle driver not having to have insurance, and if he hit, was to hit somebody, well, they can ride off and it doesn't really matter. I almost got hit on, uh, on, the, on uh, Finch Avenue, where I have a constituency office. I got out, walked across to go get to uh, the, the parking space, I turned around, and there was the bicycle. No warning, no bell, nothing. So once we consider what we want to do, I think we should consider it carefully. I will be supporting uh, Deputy Mayor's motion to uh, look at uh, getting rid of the bicycle lanes in the wintertime because I don't believe that they will be fulfilling anything. And I think that we should be asking in some separate motion and some separate time our city manager to s talk to the province and ask them to see if they can regulate e-bikes as well as bicycles. These are modes of transportation. If a mode of transportation, when it comes to a car, has to be licensed, has to have insurance, and has to be, uh, uh, the driver also has to get training, I think the other should be equally also looked upon and done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Davis to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, I first want to, as others have done, absolutely commend our transportation services staff. This has been a, a comprehensive process um, with an analysis uh, that has been done uh, in a way that we have not done before, and I want to thank you. It's such an excellent piece of work. Um, our original bike plan, let's, t let's just um, reflect a bit on the history of the cycling planning in the City of Toronto. In 2001, we approved a plan. And over many years, we attempted to implement that plan. And for a variety of reasons, it got pushed out and budgets cut and bike lanes reversed. And we only achieved about 60% of what we wanted to build in the first plan. Then in the last <coughs> term of office, the 2012 Bikes and Trails Plan put all of our funding virtually into bike trails and into building downtown separated lanes. But we did not look again at building a network for the city. And in fact, where we are right now is we spend about eight million a year on cycling infrastructure, but six million of it goes <coughs> to trails, to trails. So two million per year is simply not enough to build a network of cycling in our city. <coughs> and I know that much of the critique of the first plan was that we did not have connectivity, that we built lanes that didn't connect to others. And that's what this plan does. One of its main <coughs> goals is connections. Number one, connect. Connect the gaps, grow the network, renew and improve what exists. It is a comprehensive plan. And when you talk to, um, and if, if I might, uh, people have been talking about the money, the money, the money. We can't just do it this way. This is exactly the way that our finance staff have been asking us to move forward. Let's have a service plan, understand the impacts, and then build a budget based on a service plan. Now I'm looking forward to whatever the new methodology the city manager is going to bring forward in his fall reports. But very clearly, we are making informed choices based on costs and public policy, a public policy objective. And it's laid out very clearly in our report. I don't know how else we could be doing this. It's being done exactly as it should. People want to cycle. They are coming out in droves, and they are not safe if they are not in separated lanes or even painted lanes. We have an obligation <clears throat> to accommodate the growing number of people who are cycling. And when we put those lanes in, they will use them. 
and users will grow. There's no doubt that all research shows that. We do want people to be safe on our streets and I want to commend Councillor Robinson for accommodating those of us in the East End who recognize the importance of the Danforth. The Danforth was supposed to be studied through an EA in 2006 and it was deferred. <coughs> we know and have been under pressure for many, many years to respond to the growing demand and to look at lanes on Danforth. <laughs> the cycling community will know. <laughs> My position has been all along, we need a study. It has to be done properly. The businesses have to be at the table. The community has to be at the table. The BIAs, the community residence associations, many of them have already come forward and said, yes, we want this study. We have to look at the impacts. I'm not sure that the deputy mayor understands the number of parking lots that exist on the Danforth, off the Danforth. What is the parking capacity off the Danforth? Maybe we should be looking at how much parking will be made available, and we can address that, but let's study it. That's the purpose, Thank you, and I Councilor will be supporting Davis. that motion. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Matt Lowe to speak. Madam, Madam Speaker, um, I, like, I, like, I believe many Torontonians uh, drive a car, bike, take public transit, and walk. And I, I've heard rhetoric again today that I just wanted to address because I think it hurts our debate. Uh, when we use terms like, you know, war in the car um, and fall into our camps and then start using divisive rhetoric to argue our points, it hurts the entire discourse. It actually doesn't help us arrive where we want to arrive at. Uh, rather than even just focus on complete streets, I'd like us to focus on creating a complete city. A city that is multimodal, that supports everyone's interests to be able to get to work, to get to school, to go play uh, in, a, in a safe and, 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 and expedient way. Um, and in fact, we all win if we do that. There are no camps when it comes to building a complete Toronto. For example, if we create a safe and contiguous bike network, it supports bicyclists because whether it be summer, spring, winter, or fall, more cyclists have a safer way to get around our city. If we do that, it supports pedestrians because you will find that fewer drivers, or bicyclists rather, will opt to take sidewalks because they are scared of going on the roads, like in Councillor Kerry Janice's ward, and my ward and others, and they will choose the safe bike lanes. It supports drivers, because when I'm driving on a road, I'd actually rather the bicyclists to be in their own safe lane than right in front of me when I'm trying to get somewhere. It also means that as a driver, I'm competing with fewer other drivers, because there will be yet, along with public transportation, another mode for Torontonians to use, which are safe bike lanes. More people will choose them because they're safe and then compete less with us, those of us who are driving on the road. And as a public transit user, it supports us too. Because the more people who can opt for, bice for bicycling and take another mode, safe uh, cycle paths, it means that there are fewer people competing with us to get onto the subway, especially those of us who live at very on busy routes, like on the Young Line, where we are competing with far too many people to get into the subway during peak hours. In fact, many of us can't even get onto the subway in the morning or afternoon peak hours because there's far too many people competing to get into those trains. In other words, if we have a better transportation system, if we have roads that are functional, if we have sidewalks that are safe, and if we have bike paths that are safe, and contiguously through a network throughout our city, we all win. We all get to go places faster and safer. 
So rather than say war on this and I'm, I'm in this camp or another or I got to speak for drivers versus bicyclists or transit users or pedestrians, why don't we accept that we are the people of Toronto, we are the citizens of Toronto, we are residents here who just want to get places and want to get places safely. Now, that being said, it, this should be done through studies. You don't want to make a street dysfunctional, you want to make it complete. You want to make sure that when you change the configuration of a street and the design of a street, that it works, that it doesn't make things worse than better. Moreover, even before you announce studies, you should, you can, you should consult, you should speak with BIAs, you should speak with ratepayers associations. If there is misinformation out there, you should try to deal with that. If there are real valid concerns, you should try to mitigate and address. You should do it well, mm -hmm. but you should do it. Because if you don't do it, then we're accepting that the status quo is good for us all. And let me ask you, are you, if you're a driver, are you happy with the status quo? If you're a transit user, are you happy with the status quo? If you're a pedestrian, are you happy with the status quo? No. And if you're a bicyclist, are you happy with the status quo? If we can all agree that things need to get better and we want a more complete Toronto, then let's get rid of the divisive, sensational debate and let's focus on creating a complete city. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Speaker. I, I want to begin by acknowledging the importance of what Councillor Matlow just said. Buried in his speech was a very important and central notion to how we should think about this. What, the, what moving to bicycles does is allows us to make better use of the existing and scarce infrastructure that we have. There are only so many roads you can have in the City of Toronto. There are only so many subway, subway lines that you can have underneath the City of Toronto. And if we get people onto bicycles, we use our existing infrastructure better. We move more people without having to build major new capital infrastructure. It's something that is critical to our understanding of how we should evaluate the costs of doing things. Instead of relying on giant new mega projects in a vain attempt to try to move more people around into a very constrained downtown, what we should be doing is allocating the scarce road space better. That's the real financial and economic issue. And that's why, quite frankly, I was so disappointed at being lectured by the budget chief on the cost of this proposal. Where, where was the concern about the cost to the City of Toronto when we decided to go the hybrid route on the Gardner? Where is the concern for the cost to the City of Toronto when we go on an adventure to build the world's longest tunnel for a subway station out in central Scarborough. These are costs that are an order of magnitude larger than the cost of building the bike infrastructure that's in front of us. If we are truly prudent spenders, we spend to help the most people with the fewest dollars. I asked the general manager of transportation offline just a moment ago, if we built out the whole bike plan that's in front of us, what would we be looking at in terms of new people served? Now, I, as a caveat, he was very, very reluctant to give me a precise number. So this is back of the envelope, just ballpark numbers, okay? But let's suppose we build it out. We'd be doubling the size of the bike infrastructure. Say that attracts 50% more riders. Currently, we have between 30 and 40,000 people using our built infrastructure for bicycles. So that's another 15 to 20,000 people we'd be moving for a few million dollars more a year. 15 to 20,000 more people served. Compare that, for example, to the number that's well north of a billion dollars for the Scarborough subway to help 7,000 people in the peak. That's two orders of magnitude, sorry, three orders of magnitude's difference in terms of effectiveness of cost spending. So before you start to concern yourself with how this will cost some money, please take a look at the decisions we've taken during this term of council that are orders of magnitude worse in terms of effectively moving people in the city of Toronto, orders of magnitude less responsible in terms of public finances, orders of magnitude worse in terms of meeting the needs that the city manager outlined and that the budget chief spoke about. If you are seriously concerned about spending money effectively, about using infrastructure effectively, and 
importantly, giving Torontonians an opportunity to move around without having to buy a second or third family vehicle, saving them tremendous amounts of money, you would not only support this plan, you would be doing everything you could to accelerate it and to build it out even further. If you seriously vote against expanding as fast as we can on bicycles because of some trumped up notion that it's going to cost money, you have truly lost your way in terms of how we spend for impact, how we help Torontonians meet their budget needs, how we manage this government effectively. If you do care about how to manage public finances better, you should be getting this project done as fast as possible on the shortest timeline possible. That's the way to actually help our bottom line and the bottom lines of the people we serve. Thank you. Councillor Shiner. Councillor Shiner, do you have a motion? I have a motion, but I like this on it. If you can start my time, put up the motion, and then I will put up my overheads. Okay. So, I am, if you take it down, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't win today. Sorry, my apologies. I'm in the back with Councillor Palacio. So the motion is to add, uh, to extend the current study that's underway of a bike lane on Young Street in Councillor Fillion's ward, which is running from Shepherd Avenue up to Finch and north to the Finch bus station, and is stopping there now, and I'm asking to extend it from there up to Steeles. And I'll show you why. If I can get the overhead on. Go, David. So, I need it clear, because I'm not always clear and concise. So, the green line here is the bike lane going up to Finch Avenue and continuing up Finch Avenue to Bishop and stopping here. There you go. You good? Mm -hmm. Am I good? Good enough. Sorry. What I've outlined here is this is the TTC bus station at Finch. It comes from Bishop down to Finch. Buses come out here. Buses come out over here. Buses come out over here. And of course, they go in at the many entrances. North of it here is the regional bus system and the bus loop for GO, for York Region, and for Viva buses. So I have to tell you, it's an extremely busy location that was an with thousands of buses every day going through. This is a how do, how do you get rid overhead of, of where the current bus lane is going to go up to, and it's going to stop just south of this. There's no, this is, sorry, this is a bus lane here, it stops south. I'm confusing myself now. So I'll put this one up. The bike lane goes up to Bishop and stops. This is the middle of it, Go Transit, TTC down here. Show you a little idea how busy the area is. There's eight buses in this photo. One, two, three, four, five, six. A TTC of this coming down. Seven is a GO bus coming out. Eight is a TTC bus. The bike lanes are going to stop here. This becomes a bus lane over here. My concern is that people will drive along the bike lane and they will stop right by the busiest bus station that we have in Ontario. And they'll come off from a dedicated bike lane into a dedicated bus lane. So you're going to have these buses driving where this bike lane was. And when staff came in to see me, I said, how could you possibly stop a dedicated bike lane by the busiest bus station probably in Canada? And I said, are you going to come with me to the funeral? And they said, what funeral? I said, the one for the cyclist that's going to come off thinking he's protected on a lane and be driving in a dedicated bus lane with hundreds of buses going by. I showed you eight alone in one picture in less than a minute in that area. 
So because we've already started the review of the bike lane to bring it up to Bishop, we cannot not continue that study and bring it up to Steele's. Because I said, you're going to have a problem. And I looked at the picture, and there's the problem. I named that Little Billy. I really don't want Little Billy going home along a dedicated bike lane and then coming off right beside that great big TTC bus here and finding out that we have a problem. And to give you an example of what the problem is really like in that area, these are the pictures you don't believe. That's the traffic in the area. That's the buses. That's where the bike lane is going to be on the right side. And that's why you can't do anything else but support the study to extend it up to Steeles Avenue. Or we're really going to be putting a life in jeopardy of everybody that thinks they're driving in a safe bike lane up to that location because there's nowhere else for them to go. It's a traffic nightmare. Look at all the buses in the picture. Look at all the cars in the picture. And where do you expect when the cyclist would have been on the right of that current bus there with three entrances from the TTC station alone and the one entrance from the, the Go York Region and Viva station, where do you really expect people to go? So I really need your support to allow us to do the study on extending that bike lane from the bus station up to Steeles Avenue. Thank you. We do have for little Billy. Okay. We do have a question. <coughs> we do have a question for you, Councillor Fillion. Uh, Three minutes uh, clarification uh, of the Councilor motion. Councillor I, I, I've just seen the, the wording that you're using now. I don't have any problem with studying the area from Finch to Steeles, as we discussed. I think it's a good idea. But um, it looks like it, you're coupling it with the study that's currently underway, which has a timeline and is nearing completion. So can you, are you agreeable to changing your wording so that we complete what we're already ready to complete and so for um, clarification to you Councillor Fillion my intention in no way was to stop the work you're doing was to simply make it clear in my motion that we have one study to that location well, and I'm looking for a second study which would not stop yours to be after that because it won't start till 2017 well, can you change your wording to because it, it reads the other way if it talks you about an extension of the study currently underway Councillor Fillion, staff, with the great pleasure and help me word this with some difficulty. Anyway, I have to clarify it before we vote on it. If I have to, I'll deal with you and staff to do that. I'm more than okay. happy to do that. Okay, There's, let me make it very clear publicly. There is absolutely no intention to stop your study and make your study wait for this study. That's Thank not the intention you. of my motion. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor DiGiorgio. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I just uh, want to make a couple of brief comments uh, and throw my own views into this overall debate. I think this, this debate on, uh, on the use of <coughs> excuse me, scarce infrastructure has to be placed in the right context, and that is that we are looking at expanding options to allow people to use existing infrastructure, but we lose sight of the fact that we should try and be a little more cautious and considerate as we proceed. Now, we have, all councillors are aware that there is a, an inclination to funnel cars onto major arterial roads, especially down in the city of Toronto. If you drive anywhere down in the city, you'll see no left turn, no right, no entry. Everybody basically is directed onto major arterial roads. And given that the cars are being kept off the residential roads, why do we not say, you know what, the logical place to have cyclists roam around the city is to use the residential roads, by and large. Keep them off the arterial roads. But no, that's not what we do. What we do is we're going to introduce bicycle lanes on major arterial roads where there's already a whole lot of congestion, and we will make safety in the use of that scarce resource as our primary concern. Now, my original thought when I speak to some of the people in my area, they say, well, why don't you just widen the sidewalks and let the cyclists use the, uh, the sidewalks? Well, that introduces problems we won't go into, and that's not really a viable option. But I want to say on behalf of the budget chief, when it comes to using additional, or sorry, using scarce resources from an infrastructure point of view, 
What he's basically saying is, look, we have an envelope of funds that we are going to be able to finance our transportation needs. And if the envelope of funds, if you're going to increase the number of viable options that people have to get around the city, if you're going to say on top of transit you should be using bicycles or you should be using Uber, then we have to allocate the envelope amongst those various options. We cannot continually look to increase the envelope if you're providing options that tend to sort of work contrary to one another. In other words, the more people that use cycling as an option, the fewer people that might use transit. I don't think you're going to get people going from cars to cycling. And a lot of people in my area are beyond the age of where they might revert back to cycling, uh, at least beyond recreational use of cycling. The other thing I think that I want to talk about is I don't have a problem with cycling. But you have to understand that there are rules of the road and cyclists have to obey the rules of the road. By that I mean if a cyclist is going to be making a right turn or if I'm going to be making a right turn, invariably cyclists will pull up right up <coughs> next to me and I'm going to make a right turn. The question becomes who has the right of way? Who gets, who gets to make the right turn first? That's one problem. The way to respect the rights of the road is if you're going to be making, well, the right turn is not that bad. The left turn is where I have my fundamental problem. If I'm in a left turn lane, all of a sudden I see a cyclist come right up beside me in the left-hand lane. Why doesn't he just take a space that a car takes, and when it comes time to make a left turn, make a left turn like a vehicle would make it? Why does he pull right up alongside and take precedence? Well... That's what I mean by respect for the, right, uh, the, the rules of the road. And that comes to Mamaliti's situation of, you know, when you've got to, psych, you've got to uh, issue licenses to these people. If you're going to expand the number of cyclists almost exponentially, especially in the old city of Toronto, then you've got to introduce some rules that everybody can abide by. And then... I'm not sure who made the point. I, I think it was Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Ms. Uh, Denzel Minan Wong, who spoke about businesses uh, losing the number of parking spaces in front of their uh, sub, uh, on, on the street, where people park to, to actually uh, patronize the, the various, um, in, in his case, restaurants. I think in situations like that, we've got to work with the Toronto Parking Authority so that if we remove parking spaces, we have to look to generating uh, some parking spaces in the, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood. And then lastly, I will say, well, you know what? Thank I'll you. I'll leave. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Cho. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to echo many of the councillors who praised uh, our transportation staff. You guys did a great job. I'm really happy with the report. We have to have a long-term transportation plan. Earlier in my question period, I mentioned the two cities, Houston, Texas, and Copenhagen. You know, my uh, two sons, grandchildren, they live in Houston, Texas. I go there often. They don't have snow, but they have so many highways. I don't see any cycle or cyclist lane. And uh, there's no subway. The gas price is very cheap. But the, the, the problem is that not every city is Houston. And then I saw the pictures. Uh, my, uh, my better half uh, visited uh, Copenhagen. Over 40, 50 percent, they ride bicycle. And the bicycle parking lot is, uh, I don't know, thousands of bicycles. And uh, they park and they use that. I'd like to quote another city, uh, Beijing, China. I was there last year. I got invited to uh, Beijing University. And, uh, you know, I was really impressed. Maybe they did that because of the uh, Olympics. But the sidewalk is between motorist lane and cyclist lane. And cyclist lane is so wide, very safe. Since we are talking about 10-year infrastructure, maybe this is something that we could see that. So before come up just within the city, see how other cities, they provide different infrastructure. 
You know, I, 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 I think that those times are already gone, uh, uh, cars and words. No, we have to be reasonable. When we say the strengths, the diversity is the strengths of the city of Toronto, it's not just a cultural thing, not just a facial thing or a religious thing, the transportation. Toronto city streets should be friendly to motorists, cyclists, pedestrian, TTC users, and the people with the mobility issues, uh, like uh, Councillor Frederick Gossett says. No? So this is a great plan. And uh, when I saw, listen to Councillor Shiner's the presentation, it said, remind me that Beijing, they do excellent job. So I think we should, uh, more, we should learn from other cities. And, uh, but at the same time, we have to be very reasonable. I like to commend our budget chief. It's very easy to criticize whatever we do, but we have to see the total picture. Because the cycle uh, lane is so important, we get rid of all of the uh, projects just to cycle, we have to be reasonable. And I like to commend our good budget chief and the chair of uh, public uh, uh, works and infrastructure. We're doubling the budget, $16 million from $8 million. I will support that. That's a very good motion. And I, I like to support the, the, uh, the second motion, uh, the, all these uh, uh, cyclists, the pedestrian, et cetera, et cetera, from uh, Councillor Mary Fredericka. Pardon me for the, the last name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Hold on, Councillor Cressy. Councillor Cressy. Could I move a motion to complete the agenda before we break for lunch? No. Yes. We'll, we'll complete the agenda and not have to come back from lunch. Right. Um, Councillor Cressy is moving that we complete the agenda. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. Councillor Carroll to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, if I, if I were to base uh, uh, my opportunity here on community feedback, I, I would be making uh, adjustments to the proposal to the bike plan in my ward. Uh, the, the feedback I got from, from uh, uh, community in my ward is not unlike Councillor Karagiannis' uh, uh, ward. We, we have a growing number of cyclists. First it was in the evening, increasingly it's now throughout the day. And, and what they said was, why are we always relegated to trails? I want on road, we get these giant roads, Don Mills Road and Shepherd, why can't we have lanes? Uh, but those are things that the, that the plan gives me an ability to address. Uh, we have major uh, uh, transportation transit projects coming through the area, so I don't want to jeopardize any of that. And there is plenty of room in this plan to do some of that staff to staff and community to staff interaction. But I do want to speak because I want to address, I, I'm, I, I'll say through you, Madam Speaker, with all due respect, I'm disappointed uh, in this day and age to hear the current chair of works and the former chair of works uh, so concerned about businesses when there is not anecdotal evidence but empirical evidence, empirical data that shows that this does nothing but improve business. I used uh, in my questions when I was asking if Mr. Buckley was aware of this, uh, this data, the most modest numbers, the 17%, the 40%. There was a street in the Bronx where, where retail sales went up 505%. But I thought no one would believe me. But it's there. You can go to Ms. Sadiq Khan's uh, uh, website and read the, read the study, the economic benefits and sustainability of complete streets. And it's all about active transportation that includes cycling infrastructure. And why are they doing it? Why are they doing it in New York? It's demographics. I've said this till I'm blue in the face. In 1993, more babies were born in any, than in any year of the World War II baby boom. And they're fundamentally different from those baby boom babies. We don't provide them with full-time jobs with rich benefits anymore. We provide them with contracts, temporary contracts. And so they've adjusted. They work, then they go back to school, then they work, then they go back to school. They jump from contract to contract and, and knowledge industry job to knowledge industry job and finally to entrepreneurial activities. That's how they're climbing in their much different way up our economic ladder. And to live that lifestyle 
you're not going to buy two cars. Many will not even buy one car. And if we are not, in any major city in Canada, if we are not designing a city for the success of those babies born in 1990 to 1993 for when they are 40, when we hope that they've gotten there and they have a large amount of income, if we're not designing the city they want, we're in trouble because they'll go elsewhere. They're much more flexible and they'll go there. They'll go where they need to go to live the lifestyle they want to lead. Ms. Sadiq Khan, who's now the world leader in transportation planning, recognized that and that's why she began the transformation, not just of Manhattan, but out to Brooklyn, and I think we all know what's happened in Brooklyn, and now out to the Bronx, the street that's now up in retail sales and business vitality by 505% is in the Bronx. So I call that an inner suburb. This empirical data is available to you. Read it now so that you have the confidence as your plan goes forward. I'm just going to read you the last paragraph. It is important to note that based on the analysis presented in this empirical study, the contribution that 21st century streets can make to local economies applies just as much to lower income neighborhoods with mom and pop retail as to glitzier areas with sky high rents. Better streets with cycling infrastructure provide benefits to businesses in all types of neighborhoods from the central business district to modest retail strip malls in residential areas. This insight can help policymakers and designers integrate the measures described in this report into the toolbox for local economic development capture more spending in neighborhoods, and grow jobs. That's what you're doing today. Economic development. I beg you people, get on Ms. Sadiq Khan's website and read this study. This is money well spent. And just like the arguments we made in culture yesterday, for the dollars you spend here, you'll get several dollars back, decades to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam, speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd like to move a motion, and the clerks will put this on the screen, that City Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services as part of the implementation of the bicycle parking strategy to consult with the Director of Urban Design, City Planning, and the Cycling Community regarding best practices in architecture and design for new buildings to ensure that cycling and access and egress from city streets to indoor and outdoor uh, bicycle parking is efficient, safe, and user-friendly. Uh, you'll recognize that the bicycle parking strategy is part of an initiative that is com completely tied to the report that's before you uh, and, uh, and entirely uh, relevant to the discussions. Um, and I bring this to your attention largely because uh, in downtown Toronto, the area of midtown, downtown that I represent, we've seen a, a large number of developers walk through the door. Uh, they are uh, putting forth some proposals that are quite... Uh, uh, quite large. Uh, there's a lot of density and uh, and there's not a single development that we have approved in War 27 uh, and I would even argue, I, I believe in the Toronto East Shore Community Council where the developers have met the parking ratios. But just about everyone these days is meeting the bicycle parking ratios. So we know that the shift is coming because we're building the infrastructure to support active transportation but we haven't built the bicycle network. So the bike lanes and the bikeways have not kept up to pace with the approvals that are coming down the pipeline. Now what's going to happen is that we're going to have a population living and working, studying and playing, all in the, in the, in the core and, and hopefully uh, moving beyond the core of uh, people who will need to use the roads and they're going to be using the roads on their bicycles. Um, but we're not building the infrastructure for them, which is why it's so important for us to look at city building in its totality and plan it in a way that's going to be functional and that's going, that's going to make sense. Um, and we want, we want to be doing it in a way that's going to provide greater connectivity. Um, I think that, you know, we, we've often talked about, uh, uh, about, the, about the big paradigm shift when it comes to uh, of urban development, about how we need to sort of reevaluate the users of the road. And I think that it's t long time um, that we need to start shifting away from the prioritization of commuters and subsidizing commuters, uh, which are less and less in population and more and more in terms of the uh, absorption of costs in our transportation grid. 
because we're paying a lot of money to build these roads, but there's not as many people using them despite the fact that people keep talking about congestion. Where you can find congestion right now in downtown to Toronto that far exceeds anywhere else is actually just take a look at the sides, the, uh, the congestions on our sidewalks and, uh, and, and, and where the bicycles are, are being forced. Uh, every single day if I ride my bicycle, I know that there's a very good chance uh, that my commute to a city hall, I could be hit because there's not a bicycle uh, network on, on, on Dundas. And it's really, really dangerous every time I leave the house because I may not make it to city hall in one way or the other. Um, and for those who've actually been hit by a car on a bicycle, you know how dangerous it is. And that could be your kids, it could be uh, family members who are commuting going from A to B, and we have not taken into consideration their safety. We take into consideration a lot of other things at this, in this chamber, but somehow when it comes to pedestrian, uh, pedestrian and cycling safety, it's always compromised. And I would actually argue that uh, when, we take a, when we compromise on, on those things, we actually compromise on our values. We pride ourselves as a city that wants to build um, an inclusive city, a healthy city a hopefully aspiring to be a climate change resilient city. Otherwise, if you talk all that, if you say all those words and you do absolutely nothing to actually even double and triple our efforts to, to expand the cycling network, then everything you've said is absolutely me me meaningless. The next time you go to a community meeting, do an environment day uh, or, or take a podium, because uh, everything you say will, will not have value because your actions did not uh, back up your words. There is uh, already uh, movements abroad. I know that Councillor Carroll is a big fan of uh, uh, Janet Sedek Khan and so am I. But the City of Toronto has already been leading and our transportation staff has been telling you uh, over and over again that the change has got to come and we need to plan for it. And so we don't need to look outside of the City of Toronto to take a look that we already have an active streets program that we have an open streets program that is largely being pioneered from the outside and hasn't received any support from the city and hopefully that will change in short order because there are other places in the world where the city is leading and so we don't need to look anywhere else the leadership is here and I'm hoping that it's on the floor of council today thank you Councillor, I'm going to need a copy of Councillor Wong Tam's motion, please, so I can review it. Councillor Layton to speak. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have a motion that City Council amend Public Works and Infrastructure Recommendation 2 by de deleting the words 16 million and Scenario 3 in Appendix 8 and replace them with words 25 million and Scenario 5 in Appendix 10. And then so the recommendation is changed thusly. The big question here isn't whether we should build this or not. It's how fast do we want to build it? How fast do we want to make our streets safer? How fast do we want to relieve congestion? These are at the core of what we're debating here. What's been presented is a 10-year cycling plan that will be done in 12 years. At least that's what's being recommended by, uh, uh, by, the public, uh, by the Public Works Committee. But we have an, an option here that can build that 10-year that plan in seven or eight years so that we can realize the safety and the, the, the safety benefits and the congestion relief faster. The plan aims to both connect existing routes, grow the network so that it can serve more individuals and renew our existing, uh, existing facilities. Now this isn't only for downtown. This is for all across the city, on street, just off street. And one of the key pieces when you look down and what routes are being, uh, being suggested are ones that will facilitate better integration of smart track into the city's transportation plan. Now I'm going to get um, our folks uh, upstairs to please bring up the, uh, the overhead. 16 million is a good start. I'll, I'll give you that. But 25 million would be much better at realizing our goals. And it will allow us to do that faster. It's not that we w are, 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 are doing something that we wouldn't be doing anyhow. It allows us to do them faster. And why? And I'm going to try to explain to you why and convince some votes here. So play, I, I'd appreciate if you paid particular attention because I think there's some interesting stuff here. The first one is safety. This is a map of all of the bicycle accidents, collisions, in the last three months in the city of Toronto. They're going to be keeping a running total on us here. They're going to be watching. Now, um, like many of you, I get around the city in different ways depending on A, where I'm going, and B, what I'm doing. 
And so some days that requires me to drive. <gasps> some days I take public transit. And some days I ride my bike. Most days I ride my bike. It's easier to get around. It's less expensive. It lets me to fight, helps me fight climate change and do all those great things. And, and I do walk always. Between all of those trips is walking. Now, my, I grew up cycling, and I'm very comfortable cycling in the city of Toronto. My wife is not, sadly. She grew up in a smaller town, Ontario, and when she came to Toronto, she was a bit intimidated by the traffic out there. And I, I, if you don't ride a bike every day, or didn't since you were 10 years old, riding behind your dad on the tandem, you, w you probably wouldn't be as comfortable. And I'll get you that. But statistics show that 75% of residents say that the lack of cycling infrastructure is holding them back from cycling more often. That's almost three quarters of the public isn't cycling even though they could because they don't have confidence in either their own abilities or in their safety on the road. Now further to that, in a fully blind study of Torontonians done in April, 86% supported safer cycling network across our city. Two thirds supported building it in less than nine years. Two thirds in less than nine years, exactly what I'm proposing with my motion. 84% of people in East York, 79% of people in Etobicoke, 84% in North York, and 88% in Scarborough approved of building this faster and increasing the resources we are putting into this. Second, I just wanted to say that I think that on the consultation piece, we have spent an enormous amount of time and you can't imagine, Councillor Holliday, how much effort was put in to the consultation along Bloor Street. When we put in the Contraflow Lane on Shaw as the local councillor, I took it upon myself to get some of those core pieces consulted with the public as early as we possibly could. How we're going to pay for it is a question that's come up a couple times. And we said, uh, we, can't, we can't keep writing checks we can't cash. But in this chamber, as Councillor Perks pointed out, many of you voted on increasing the budget by $400 million to the Gardner Expressway without knowing where that money was going to come from. $400 million. More than what we needed. More than the, the, the almost, hundred million that, uh, uh, almost billion that we needed to do something with it. Many of you voted without knowing how, where all the money was going to come from for a Scarborough extension of the subway. That's going to, and I won't get into Councillor Matlow's argument about serve less people uh, uh, for, for, for more money. The, the reality is that if you want to build infrastructure, this chamber has been more than willing to put the money in. And all I'm suggesting is let's put that money in. Thank, thank a little you, bit Councillor faster. Layton. We do have questions for you. Councillor Holliday, three minutes, clarification. I don't need three minutes. So, Councillor. Uh, how will we pay for this? What will we cancel in order to and don't make say this work? Or subway. What taxes good. should we raise to pay for this? Cation of the motion. All right. Well, okay. So the same question that was asked me, did, did, uh, did Councillor Layton consult with all the councillors that were affected by the change? By what changes? By uh, increasing the scope of work. I, I'm... Same Councilor, question this you was, asked me. This was, this was entirely laid out in the appendix of the report, if you ah, cared to read them. I see. Well, I most certainly did go through that in detail. So it's the same question you asked me. Did you consult with all the councillors that were affected by the change in scope? The staff, I believe, c consulted with all of the councillors on all the several scenarios that were being put out. Ah, much the same way they did in the way I changed scope, correct? I don't know how you, uh, you, you mentioned that you didn't consult with councillors about the changes okay. you were proposing. Okay. I'm, I'm proposing one of the five scenarios that were actually in the As report. As I did. Councillor Hall. You Thank did you. not, sir, you did not propose something that was in, listed in the report. I am proposing Appendix 5. Thank you. Councillor Robinson. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you if you're aware that we've more than quadrupled our cycling budget over the last 10 years. More than quadrupled. Are you aware of that? And I do think we should continue on in that, in that direction, given other, other municipalities are currently contributing more per capita for cycling. We should try to strive to be the same. And we are now more than today doubling the amount of infrastructure and doubling our annual investment to the tune of $153 million. And as I said in my remarks, I think that's a good start, but I think we can do better. And doing better is outlined in Appendix 5. It just spends the same amount of money, just realizes those benefits faster. 
So are you also aware that the report indicates and staff are very confident that if we come to the table with the $16 million funding scenario, that will bring partners like the federal and provincial government to the table to help us offset some of these costs and augment them? I, you know, I, I, I appreciate they may be optimistic, but I might not be as optimistic as them as we've been debating in Budget Committee how to deal with the $140 billion shortfall that came from the provincial government as a result of deleting the pooling compensation. Well, I, I'm, I'm also, I share their confidence. And I think if, why do we have to fill the entire bill? Why aren't those partners coming to the table? Do you not want to encourage those partners to come to the table and help fund this? I certainly do, but without any certainty in that regard, I think that we should try to build this project in seven years rather than 12. And your point on getting it done faster, so it's not actually accurate. The more money we throw at this, the faster we can, uh, unfold, uh, it, it can unfold. Because we're, what we're trying to do, and I'm sure you've heard this complaint in your ward, when you do a rip up a road and a few years later staff yeah, rip Councilor it up again. Councillor Robinson, clarification. Okay, so I will. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So what staff have said in the report is if we're really focused on capital coordination, it's not necessarily about how much money we throw at this. No, but it, you, you'll, you'll recognize in Appendix 5 that it outlines what the $16 million will get us in, in, and in the number of years and what the $25 million will get us in the same number of years, and it is a significant amount of work done faster. So the road safety plan is coming this month uh, to Public Works, and do you agree we need to balance our limited capital dollars to improve safety for all road users, not just one? Well, I think uh, given, that, given that the City of Toronto, this council chamber, supported $400 million of unneeded money to go to the Gardner Expressway to, to, bet, to the benefit of a very limited number of Torontonians uh, and others coming to this great city, um, I, I don't think that $25 million a year, for, or, or ramping up to $25, uh, $25 million a year is much to ask. And given what we heard from Councillor Mahavik about how much money is being spent per capita in other municipalities, it really is, is, is quite small, the increase. It would still keep us behind cities like Montreal and Vanc certainly well behind Vancouver and Canada and cities like Seattle in the United States. Thank you. Councillor Matlow, clarification of the Sorry. motion. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Speaker, over here, Councillor Layden. Um, you've heard some arguments from um, some members saying that uh, there's no source for the 25 million that you're uh, recommending to, to serve as this plan as quickly as you'd like. Have you heard that? I have heard it just as recently as three minutes ago. <laughs> have, you heard, have you heard any of those members tell you the source of the $16 million that they would support? I have not. Although I did hear the, the comment from staff that they would be able to pri uh, prior they would prioritize projects within their existing uh, capital plan, and that's how they plan on finding that $16 million. So do I infer correctly that if there is no clear source for the $16 million and there's no clear source for the $25 million, what you're asking is to simply prioritize, and then we would have to have a debate through a budget process about how to fund it. I, I think that that notion of priority is, is yes and. I think that notion of priority is very important because given that we would still be be rolling out most of these projects anyhow, it would just take for more, more and more years, you're essentially saying we're going to prioritize the other work that's non-cycling related over work that is cycling related. Okay, so you're arguing that this is simply uh, a higher priority than perhaps some of the other... And I'm not arguing that it should be the highest priority. We still are, as a percentage-wise, the $25 million a year is up to $25 million a year is quite small compared to the overall budget of I'd transportation. I'd still like to know where the $16 million is going to come from, too. I trust that staff will determine where that and, or 25 will come from. Thank you. Councillor Fillion to speak. Thank you. Briefly, Councillor Shiner has added some wording to his uh, motion, so I don't need to uh, amend it. Uh, I support um, certainly continuing on um, north of Finch what we are currently planning between Shepherd and Finch, which will um, totally transform um, that part of the city. And um, I think if we don't, uh, and I do support Councillor Layton's motion, if we don't um, uh, get out in front of um, this or, or try to catch up with the demand, we're going to be in the same situation that we are with uh, transit, just 
decades uh, behind the times. Over the next 10 to 25 years, the way people get around this city is going to be totally transformed between um, new technology and the driverless car is coming uh, much sooner than most of us realize, combined with um, sharing Uber and, and um, multiple other uh, very large companies like Apple and Google that are going to be getting um, involved in the business, combined with the preferences of millennials not to own a car, um, we're going to see that it is much more important to be concentrating on uh, bike lanes and uh, friendly pedestrian environments than it is to be focusing on where we park our cars and, uh, and lanes of traffic. So um, it's great that we're moving ahead and I, I support those who want to move ahead uh, faster. Speech. Councillor de Bearmaker mm. to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I certainly would support uh, virtually all of the amendments or additional motions that have come forward, except perhaps for Councillor Holliday's. At first, I was very excited, seeing that my colleague was moving motions on bike lanes. I thought, great, the good people of Etobicoke are going to have bike lanes everywhere. And uh, then, I, then I read the motions, and so I've decided not to uh, support those ones. But, uh, Madam Speaker, um, I guess between uh, Tuesday when we started this council meeting and, and tonight or this afternoon when we leave, I'll have uh, traveled, I guess, 120 kilometers on, on not bike lanes, but from my home to City Hall and back. 20 kilometers in, 20 kilometers back. Uh, a lot of the times in the summer months when it's certainly warm and comfortable, uh, not so much this last winter just because of uh, schedule and, and cold weather, um, but I've seen firsthand, experienced firsthand everything that happens on the streets. And my first reaction reading the report is, of course, one of thanks, but also one of thanks to all the drivers that I interact with. I've been cycling to work for 13 years now since I got elected, and before that when I worked at Metro Hall for Councillor Doug Mahood. But for, as, as an elected official for 13 years, I've been cycling to City Hall. I've never been hit, and in the tens of thousands of vehicles that have passed me on the road, they have all been, really, I can't think of one driver that had road rage or that purposely cut me off or behaved in an unsafe manner. Uh, it's, there's, I'm very grateful um, to my fellow citizens and residents who share the road with me. I happen to be on a bike, they happen to be on a car. When they see me cycling along the curb, they move over to give me a little bit of extra space to make sure I'm safe. I really appreciate that. So I think what many cyclists are asking for us to do today is to make sure, a simple request, and I think the staff report will, will give them this, is to make sure that when they go to work and when they go home, they're safe. They're not engaging in a war on the car or on buses or the TTC or pedestrians. All people want to do is the same thing that we want to do. You want to go to work and you want to be safe. There are 40,000 people a day who commute to work on bike. 40,000 people a day. So when we talk about the millions of dollars and how much over this much time, you have to remember, and that's an old statistic from 2011, 40,000 people a day, 40,000 of our neighbours and friends are getting on their bikes every day and coming to work. Most of them don't travel 20 kilometres like I do. A lot of them are 10 kilometres or 8 kilometres. But they risk their lives every day that they go to work. And when I drive to work, I, yes, I could be injured, but I know most of the time if, if somebody rear-ends me in a car, I might get, um, it's a little fender bender, I, I doubt I'm going to get hurt, but certainly the consequences for anyone on a bike uh, being in an unsafe situation is dramatically different and could be catastrophic to them. Uh, when we uh, put bike lanes in on Richmond, the daily average eight-hour count went up from 500 people using the bike lane or, or that street to 1,300, so over doubling, almost tripling. From 500 people a day to 1,300 people today. Over on Ad Adelaide, very similar numbers. There are 550 people using that street on bikes every single day. Those 500 people deserve protection. When we put in the bike lanes to protect them, the number went up to 1,575 people. That's an incredible increase. When we look at Queen's Key, 
Queen's Key is a, is a road that I have cycled and I can tell you it used to be very dangerous, but I used to cycle it when I would go over to, the, to Metro Hall. 50 people a day used to ride their bikes to get to work and back on Queen's Key. And there, think of it, 50, not a lot of people because they voted with their bicycles. They voted to get off that road because they didn't want to die. When we put in the bicycle pass there, there are now 400 to 500 people every peak hour on that road. So from, from 50 people an hour at the peak times to 500 people, a tenfold increase. People want to get to work safely and if you give them a way to get to work safely, they will actually ride their bikes. Not everybody, but for all these people, the 40,000 people who ride their bikes, if they're not riding their bikes, they're going to be in the subways, on the streetcars, or in their cars, slowing down the, the travel for everybody else. So, Madam Speaker, I would encourage my uh, colleagues to support this plan. I'll uh, support Councillor Layton's motion, uh, I'll call it an aspirational motion as well, to get up to $25 million. But certainly, at $16 million a year, it's a doubling of the budget. It's an incredible investment in people's safety, and I think it's one that we should all support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor. <laughs> the last speaker is Councillor Cressy, and then the mayor will speak last. Uh, thank you, Cressy. Madam Speaker. And, and in the interest of, of time, <laughs> of time and <laughs> hunger, I will be brief. I uh, obviously thank you to our, our staff for the tremendous and long work that was put into this, as well as to all our colleagues and and members of Pewick for I think the rather civil and important debate we have and have had, with the exception of a few holdouts. It is clear that the debates, the old debates of the war on the car and bikes versus cars, they're over. They are done. I think increasingly and thankfully we all collectively are recognizing that cycling infrastructure is a win-win for everyone. Um, the challenge and, and the point that the number that really brings it home for me is always around population growth in our city, which is that a million people are moving into the city of Toronto in the next 25 years. And into the greater region, there will be 5 million people moving in in the next 25 years. And there is not the road capacity to support it with just cars. It does not exist. We can't widen the roads. We can't build new roads in much part of downtown or in the entire city. Rather, we have to make the transition to more active modes of transportation. And that's not just cycling. That's walking, that's cycling, that's public transit. This is one piece of the broader puzzle around more active modes of transportation, and that's why this is part of transportation. It's not just cycling infrastructure, it's coming out of transportation services. In cycling infrastructure, it is good for safety. It makes it safer for drivers and cyclists. It is absolutely good for the environment. If you reduce less emissions, you're improving the planet. Let's not be afraid to say it. And it's good for local business. And I hope that Bloor Pilot will show that. And I intend to shop on Bloor every day for a year to help make sure that that works. Now, the, the critical piece around cycling infrastructure is that it takes a grid. Arterial streets, uh, residential roads, trails. It requires all together, just like cars and roads. You cannot have bike lanes to nowhere. It doesn't work otherwise. So you require a grid, and that's what this 10-year plan, or seven years, helps us to achieve, is a grid. That's what's critical. Uh, Jared Kolb, who we all know because he's in our offices every week, wearing that damn bike helmet all the time. It's always the same helmet. He's here, he has a great quote, which is, um, bikes are an 18th century invention that are transforming 21st century cities. I like that quote. Uh, I think it is time for Toronto to get on board as a 21st century city. Now the six mil $16 million option, um, that's a significant and important increase. And, and I do want to recognize the chair of PWIC for getting us to that point. It has not been easy, I know, to forge in an attempt to appease many a consensus on that number. So that, let's recognize that. But I want to note a percentage that's important when we talk about appeasing all. 81% of non-cyclists in the City of Toronto support implementing this plan in seven years, not ten. That's 81% of non-cyclists in the city support the seven-year option. That's the polling information out there. And so 
If you ask me, exceptionally hard work has gone in to trying to create a consensus around 16 million. And let's recognize that. But I think Toronto deserves better than that consensus. Torontonians have told us they want better than that consensus. So let's be ambitious. Let's do it on this issue. And I would encourage you to support Councillor Layton's motion, his amendment, and the amended motion through our leadership, the Chair of Peewick. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. I know there was nobody there and she, he put his name on. I, I did say last. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I'm I'm going to support the um, uh, I, I'm going to support the plan uh, uh, as it came forward uh, uh, from the Works Committee, and I'm going to support some of the motions that have uh, uh, been proposed uh, here today. And, and I'm going to do that, um, Speaker, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think the people who who cycle and the people who love to cycle, they're out there cycling. Um, there's a portion of them you don't have to build any, uh, any lanes for. <clears throat> They'll get out there uh, as I get out there, and we'll ride in the middle of the street, we'll ride in the middle of the lane, just simply because we love it, and that's the way we get around. It's unsafe, but we will do that. Then there's another a tier of, of riders, a tier of people, who will venture out to go out on a bike if you make the riding environment safer for them. And I think that that's why you've seen an increase, uh, in, uh, especially in the downtown area, where you have, uh, you know, uh, safe uh, uh, lanes to ride on, separated lanes to ride on. I've certainly seen an increase, and I ride a lot on the trails, for example. I've certainly seen uh, um, an increase uh, on those because uh, they're really safe to ride on, you know, other than the occasional person walking the dog and, you know, they have those long leashes that kind of like extend out and they're on one side of the trail and the dog's in the bushes on the other and, you know, like, and, uh, then it becomes a little risky. But, by and large, there's lots and lots of folks uh, doing that. So how do we encourage more and more people to ride? And, and riding a bike is a difficult thing. Uh, it's, it's, for a lot of people, it's a scary concept. Imagine sitting on a seat that's going to hurt your rear end, right? Uh, and then you've got to get out there and you've got to do some, like, physical work. You do, you know, unless you power the bike with a little motor, you can do that now. And lots of people do that, and they have combinations of those who can get around. And that's great, because what happens is it actually extends it to even more people. So if you're like, if you think that physically you can't do it, then you put a little motor on your bike and all of a sudden, now, you know what? Now, between both, between my leg power and the motor power, I can get around. Then there's another group of people still who would get out and, 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 and move around on their bikes if you made things safe. I wouldn't ride my bike on Finch Avenue, and I love to ride my bike. I'll ride it on the sidewalk. Why? I'm not going to ride in the middle of tanker traffic. It's nuts. 18-wheelers and such. We've been working to get bike lanes on Finch Avenue for the longest time. Would people ride it? Of course they would. I know. I live there. I know a lot of the people that ride bikes up and, up and, and around it. I wouldn't, I, and they don't either. So some areas you just can't. We have some 5,600 kilometers of roads in the city of Toronto. 5,600 kilometers of roads for cars. Cars, buses, trucks, you name it. You know how many kilometers of bike lanes we got? Relatively safe uh, uh, bike lanes? 115 kilometers. One and a half percent? 2%, and people are whining about it. Saying, oh my God, this is like crazy. Oh, bikes in front of cars, bike lanes, oh, give it up to you. 1%. 1% of road space. Too many. You know what the plan does? Plan builds out 525 kilometers. Gets us to what? 9%. 10%. 
So when people come out and say, oh my God, I'm giving up roads, and that doesn't include the, the off-road, the, uh, you know, the trails. But the trails are part of that kilometerage. So when people come up and whine about how they're all of a sudden going to have bikes in front of them on the street, like 9%, 525 kilometers versus 5,600. 5, you got like, you got like 5,000 kilometers of roads technically with no bike lanes. You're not supposed to be sharing them with nobody. No cars either. And they cry about it. It's thank, absolutely insane. Thank we you, Councillor Peruta. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, before we go to the mayor, Councillor Wong Kam, you want to uh, introduce someone that's in the council chambers? Yes, thank you very, yes, thank you very much, ma uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, in a point of pri uh, personal privilege, I'd like to everyone in the chambers to recognize uh, that we have a very special visitor, someone who's traveled from abroad, uh, who's actually witnessing some of the debate uh, on, uh, on the floor today, and that is uh, Madam uh, Rajni Abdi, who is the former mayor of Delhi, a great city of 14 million people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she actually informed me that uh, in, in, her, uh, in her city, uh, councillors are elected for terms of five years, and, uh, and that almost everyone, not everybody, <laughs> almost <laughs> But, uh, but she's also uh, served as, as mayor, and it should be noted that the mayors serve for one-year terms, and they are appointed by members of council. That means that uh, if we were to bring that system here, if we wait it long enough, we can all have our, our turn in the mayor's seat. <laughs> so thank you. thank you very much. Okay. Um, mayor Tory. I'd only say with respect to that last suggestion, Madam Speaker, be careful what you wish for. Um, there are days. Madam Speaker, uh, first of all, um, may I begin by thanking the staff because I think they have, as usual, done a very good job of laying out for us a lot of thoughtful uh, information and, and some options in this case, uh, and we're discussing those options. They had a recommended option, and, uh, but I want to thank them, and I want to thank the members of Council for what I think has been uh, a, a good uh, discussion uh, this morning. Uh, what are we trying to do? I mean, we're, we're trying, obviously there are things you'd like to do as quickly as possible. I was saying to Councillor Mamaliti, sure, we'd like to build transit a lot faster too in the context of being able to speed up how long it's going to take us to do that. But we're trying, I think in the end, in terms of the overall objective, to take account of the needs and the aspirations and the realities uh, when it comes to transportation options as we try to build, as a number have said, the city of the future, the city that takes account of what the future is going to be, what the 21st century is going to bring. Um, and and a, a big part of that is sustainability, a big part of that is the increase in population referred to by Councillor Cressy, and a big part of that is the fact that a lot of things are going to change uh, in, the ha in the context of the habits of uh, younger people, in the context of the, the technology of transportation, uh, and so on. We're trying to produce choice for people. I mean, it comes back to other discussions we've had in here, uh, choices that are all safe for people, but that they do have choice. And the choice, and, and I, I will just say for myself, I completely reject the use of and the implications of all this rhetoric about wars on anybody. We're trying to produce an integrated, balanced transportation system here, and that takes into account the coincident interests. They're not competing interests. They're coincident interests of pedestrians and cyclists and motorists and transit users and, 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 and other coincident interests that come up for consideration obviously include business and retail and, and so on. And it is meant to take account of our responsibility here, which is also to oversee the evolution of the city. And there's no question an evolution is taking place. I mean, anybody who says that's to be denied and that, that everything's going to be the way it's been or we should be sort of doing the planning on the basis of the rules from the 1950s or whatever um, are, are not uh, right. Um, so notwithstanding, uh, you know, some things that have been said, I mean, I, I as usual in the job that I have, which is a, a job that carries with it citywide, um, a citywide responsibility, uh, have to look at all these different uh, positions and camps and groups and coalitions. And I should say in offering thanks, by the way, I should thank uh, Jared Kolb as well in Cycle Toronto. They have been uh, doing, a, uh, I was going to say they've been doing a good job educating me and he might reject that, so might others when they hear what I'm going to say, but I don't think so. He's been helpful to me uh, in understanding these issues better as have a number of other people in this room. But I think that if you look at the fact there are motions right on the floor today saying take it back to 8 million, and there are other motions saying take it up to 25 million, and part of my job is to sort of look at what we're trying to do, and I tried to articulate that, and trying to look as well at the art of the possible in terms of drawing a consensus in this room that will uh, be uh, accepted by enough people to carry the day. 
And uh, so I have concluded on that basis that the, uh, the proper thing to do for, for this stage of the, of, the, of the situation, the challenge in front of us today, is to go to uh, $16 million. And I will be supporting, uh, accordingly, not only that uh, proposal put forward originally by Councillor, Rob Councillor Robinson and the committee, uh, but also I'll be supporting her motion to uh, take account of, of uh, something she's developed, I think, uh, and I thank her for doing it in collaboration with the Danforth councillors to ad address the question of that uh, particular uh, corridor. And I will say, I think this represents, uh, Councillor Layton said it's a good start. I think it's even better than that. It's a significant step forward to take the resources uh, that were at uh, the level of $8 million uh, and to take it to something that's going to be double that and produce double uh, the results, I think is important. And I think it really represents a change in the way we're doing business in this area, which is the old way, and I think it's true in a number of areas of, uh, of, of uh, city government, the old way was to set targets that were very ambitious and sometimes too ambitious, to be frank, not to fund them and then not to achieve them. And I think what we're trying to do here today in, in advocating for the 16 million is to say we're going to set a target that has a level of ambition to it, but is achievable, is to be funded, and will be achieved. And will be achieved. Because I can tell you for my part, I don't stand here ever, and I don't think anybody consciously does, and vote for a plan that I know is never going to be achieved. In fact, quite the opposite. I want to be able to stand in front of people and say we approved that plan and we went out and did it. And so I will not support the 25 million because I think it is something that won't have that necessary consensus. I'm not sure it is something that we can do just at this point in time. I do support uh, the 16 million. I do support uh, the, having a look at seasonal bike lanes because I think that could allow us to do even more uh, in a way that would carry it with it, with it the consensus of the people uh, at times of the year when admittedly I think we'd all have to admit <coughs> there's more demand for cycling uh, infrastructure than at some other times of the years. Um, I think this plan is a good plan because, and I will wrap up, Madam Speaker, it does uh, extend, uh, fill in the gaps, which Mr. Kolb has told me is the most important thing to do. It extends cycling infrastructure into other parts of the city. It makes it safer, uh, and it will make a big difference going forward. And so uh, that is how I will, um, that is how I will uh, cast my own votes today, and uh, I'm, uh, I think it will be a proud accomplishment for us, actually, in moving us forward, not to Nirvana, but to a place that is better than where we were before and something we will achieve uh, starting in the term of this council. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay. We're going to put the order um, on the screen for you. Uh, 4C was ruled out of order. That can, at a later date, Councillor Holliday, if, if you want to introduce it at committee, you can introduce it at committee. Yeah. Are we ready? If you, put, if you put them all in numerical order first, it only should take 10 seconds. I used to work in a bank, that's why. I did. <laughs> I, I used to put thousands of checks in numeric order. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Okay, our first motion is 3A. All in favor? Recorded? Okay. Councillor McMahon, please. Councillor Robinson and Councillor Cole, please. Deputy Mayor.
Motion 3A carries 35 to 5. Motion 9. Recorded vote. Councilor Cressy, please. Motion, f um, motion nine does not carry. The vote is 16 to 24. Motion 4A. Recorded vote. Councilor Peruzza, please. Motion 4A does not carry. The vote is 9 to 31. 4B. <laughs> so, so. Councillor McConnell, you made a mistake. Oh boy, did I make a big mistake. <laughs> so motion, motion to, re uh, to reorder, to reopen. Carry. Okay, let's start over. Motion 4A, recorded vote. No, we're voting on the item. Councillor Palacio, please. Councillor Peruzzo. No, no. We are voting, everybody. We are voting on the item. We've already reopened. We're voting on the item. On the, on the motion. The re-vote on motion 4A does not carry. The vote is 6 to 34. Four, motion 4B, recorded vote. Councillor Layton, Councillor Peruzza, please. Motion 4B does not carry. The vote is 6 to 34. Revised, revised motion number 1, recorded vote. Councillor Cressy, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Thompson. Yes. Motion one carries unanimously, 40 in favor. Motion two, recorded vote.
Professor Fletcher, please. Motion two carries. The vote is 39 to 1. Okay, motion 3B, but not, there's two parts, so we'll vote on them separately. It's been a request. 3B revised. Okay. One first, recorded vote. Councilor DiCiano, please. Councilor Kelly, please. Councilor Kelly, your vote, please. Part one of motion 3B carries. The vote is 28 to 12. Part two, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please, Councillor Kelly, and Councillor Thompson. Part two of motion 3B carries. The vote is 32 to 8. Okay. Motion number five, recorded vote. Councilor Matlow, please. Councilor Peruzza. Councilor Campbell, please. Motion number five carries. The vote is 25 to 15. Motion number six, re recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor DiGiorgio. Councillor Grimes, please. And Councillor Palacio, please. Councillor Cole, please. Motion six carries. The vote is 34 to six. Mo motion seven revised, recorded vote. <laughs> Councillor Peruzza, Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Mamaliti, please. Councillor Carmichael Greb. Councillor Mamaliti, please. Thank you. Motion number seven carries. The vote is 33 to seven. Motion eight, recorded vote.
Councillor DiGiorgio, please. Councillor Shiner. Councillor Crawford. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Motion number eight carries. The vote is 35 to 5. Okay. Item as amended. Recorded vote. Councillor DiCiano, Councillor Robinson, please. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Bailao, please. The item as amended is adopted. The vote is 38 to 2. Councillor Matlow, you have a motion that uh, needs to be introduced. Well, we're not finished yet. We still have some items left. <coughs> Councillor Matlow? I, I do, and I move it. Okay, it's on the screen. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Fletcher? I'm going to Kay. try to release a few things. Okay, you have two. I do. Count. Councillor Layton? I, I, I was just concerned that uh, they may leave the room um, before uh, I was able to uh, introduce uh, three councillors from our nation's capital who are, uh, who are here visiting. Uh, Jan Harder, Councillor Alan Hubley, and Councillor Tim Tierney, who's also the chair of the Ontario Caucus at FCM. Thank you very much for, for seeing how it's done. Oh yeah, how's that, how's that sinkhole doing? Okay, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm just going to release, um, interest of time, TE 16.7. Okay, Councillor Fletcher is releasing TE 16.7. On favour? On favour? Carried, okay? And releasing CC 19.6. And you have a motion on that. You have an yeah with my motion. That's right. Yes. If we can confidential put, motion. If we can put it on the screen, it's right there. On yeah, favor. <coughs> Recorded vote. <laughs> okay, members of council, don't leave. We still have some stuff. Paula. We still have some votes. Paula. Paula. Please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Layton. Councillor DiCiano, please. Councillor Cole, please. Councillor Mahavik. Councillor Kelly and Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Dara Barrymaker, please. Councillor Karagiannis and Deputy Mayor Minnewong, please. Okay, we're not going to, uh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. The motion to defer the item indefinitely carries. The vote is 34 to 2. Okay, Councillor Lane, you have uh, last item, your item. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And my apologies um, because I was waiting to hear back from one of the requests that was made. Um, I have two motions. One is the addition of a list of establishments for the uh, Toronto and East York Party Clause. Um, my apologies, Councillor Councillor Mamaliti. Out of respect, I'm going to just. You may be interested in the next motion. I don't know if you are, but I just wanted to make it clear. Um, and then there was a second motion. I'm doing that out of courtesy, and you'll see why. Is that uh, that that City Council advised the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario that it objects to the request for a temporary license extension for f to 4 a.m. for music, 15 Saskatchewan Road for Pride uh, Toronto Festivals to be held on June 29th and to July 23rd. I have informed Pride of this and heard back from them. 
Um, this, we, we do this customarily at Toronto and East York Community Council where we remove uh, locations who have had persistent problems uh, sticking to uh, city's bylaw and, uh, and other concerns from the surrounding community. We typically do this at community council, so that's why we only do it rarely here. The reason why it was done here is we didn't, I didn't see the request till yesterday, um, and that's when it came forward. And I, I think given some other debates, uh, I just wanted to make, uh, draw some particular attention to okay, that. Thank, okay, hold on. It looks like we have some questions on that's that fine. one. That's fine. No, that's fine. Huh? Yes, I know. That, that's what I mean, yeah. So you've, inter you've uh, introduced two of those motions, amendments, on your item T16.70. So we have questions. Councillor DiCiano. Can you just put that motion back up? Because it wasn't circulated. I mean, yeah, can we circulate this? Well, nobody got it. He just introduced it now. Okay. And that's why I gave you the courtesy of telling you what was about to happen, Councillor Mamaliti. I think I've been very above board about this. It's the next... I, I couldn't have done it yesterday because I hadn't yeah, heard back to until to today from the organizers okay, of Pride. Hold on, so Council that's why I, I oh, held it until okay, late, I could count, get back. Sorry, Councillor Layton, Dici yes. Councillor Diciano is on the floor to ask you a question. Okay, Councillor Diciano. Well, uh, I've got no further questions other than to say that I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Perks, question on the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Layton, um, so my understanding is you're doing this because, uh, as is policy. Yeah. If you want to go ahead, Councillor, you go ahead. All right. Um, as is policy at Toronto East York Community Council, where we have outstanding orders or a pattern of violation of orders or a large number of community complaints. Is that the case with this? I do it sparingly, location? but I do it in those cases when, uh, uh, when, when these issues have come up. There are not many of them. I did inform in my first year of office, office to all those that seek these extensions that, that those would be the parameters of me granting those extensions. We have very little ability to influence the behavior of businesses uh, uh, of, of various kinds. Um, this is one of the ones that uh, we don't seek to grant. Um, additional privileges if they have a pattern of not fulfilling their end of the uh, their side of the bargain and uh, I take it uh, that also when you did this perhaps you were mindful of the motion that Councillor Palacio moved uh, which I think was supported unanimously here yesterday that uh, we asked the Alcohol and Gaming Commission to review licenses for establishments uh, where there have been repeated problems with guns yes thank you thank you Councillor Mamaliti, question. So you started out by saying that, that this was a, I forgot the term that you used, but in this location it's a, it's a, it's a constant? Is there there have said? been persistent concerns by the, by the local community. No, no. How many instances have there been? that have caused uh, any difficulty? I, I believe actually within the, within the last year uh, we've submitted a letter to Council outlining uh, the, the, uh, the bylaw infractions as well as um, uh, AGCO infractions. Do they include and other the, the raves that are on that site as well or no? I don't believe just, this is just, pertinent just, to... Just, just this particular they, place. They, they don't host raves, raves at this particular uh, location. So it's just this particular location you're looking at. You're not really concerned about all the overdoses and everything that's going on no. in the raves just next door. This is about an extension till four for a liquor license at a particular location. I've reviewed the other locations on the list. None of them were a concern to me, none of which included. Has, has, has there been any uh, charges or convictions uh, on this uh, location at all of any kind? Of any kind, including yeah. AGCO convictions? Um, I, I would like to know that. Yeah, do you well, know I don't. That? I don't have that information here. I don't base mine on criminal convictions. Normally, it, it just the, the key, they just have to demonstrate that there's been a community concern, uh, and I and and I happily uh, uh, just remove them. It's not saying that they can't function at the event. It's just they that they won't receive it to a 4 a.m. extension. So and we've done this before at this committee. This isn't an isolated. Councillor, I'm time. not going to debate with you because I'm I'm probably going to vote in favor of the motion because it's out of courtesy. If I were to want to do it in my own community. I'd want to do it. I just under, have to understand the logic in which you're bringing this to the table. Because I, I just, I get, I get a sense that 
different establishments down there are being treated in different ways. Yeah. And if, if it were a, con a constant thing, then, then I could respect that. Well, we, we've tried to remain particularly constant in the way that I've, uh, I, I've applied this particular um, um, restriction. And, and what it is, and it's not even a restriction, it's not granting this. And that's when we see a persistent uh, violation of bylaws or complaints from the surrounding neighborhood. Okay. Uh, then, then if I could just just very quickly finish. Um, in this case, I looked up the complaint. I look up complaints both on our e our, our content management, uh, our, our constituency management system. I count. Uh, I talked to Councillor Perks, who represents the residential neighborhood directly to the north. And indeed, there was a consistent pattern of violations. I, I, I'm not going to dispute. I've seen. I've seen you two in action on how you can muster up uh, opinion down there. It's, it's, it's not that point I'm trying okay. to make. The point I'm trying to make is... Uh, Councillor Mamalidi, your question. You can speak if you want to put your name up to speak. Uh, maybe I should? Yeah, okay. Thank you. But just, I'd like to speak. Just, just on, the, on, on the point, because okay. I think I understand the question he's getting to, and it's those, those other events, I don't believe, come to City Council to request those extensions. And in that case, I would go through the same process of looking at the event and seeing if they have a history okay, of disrupting Okay, thank you. The thank you, Councillor Layton. We're just getting a little bit off course here. These are questions to the Councillor on his motion. Uh, members of Council that want to speak on it, please put their name up, request to, uh, to speak. Councillor Holliday, just clarification of the motion. Uh, yes. If I may have the mic. Um, through you to the councillor, can, can you help me understand, is there an event for Pride scheduled at that venue for this period, or is music a general operation during the Pride Festival? So there, there's two answers to that question. One, they're in, general, they're in general operation for those days. I contacted Pride to ask them if they had anything specific and any concerns if I removed them. They said there was nothing specific going on at that location, so they, they were not concerned. And so Pride's response to you when you asked this question was of no concern? Yes. There was no objection to this? Yes. Okay, if I may raise a point of order with, with the speaker and the clerks, I know that uh, there is often opportunity for organizations to provide input on these things. Do we have room in our process that if Pride or the club wanted to submit a letter that we would see it, or has this motion come before us without that time and that opportunity? The letter is before us. There's a letter in your communications to this. Okay. Which I only saw yesterday, which is why this is all happening very late. Okay. Yeah. We typically get them before community council, and we get like dozens of these on and a monthly basis. The letter was from Pride in support of this. Um, letter was from Pride with several organizations, several uh, establishments on it. So when we got it, we reviewed the we review the establishments, and we say yes, 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 yes. And in the rare occasion that that we say no, this is not the first time I've done this in this chamber and received unanimous. So, so okay, this is important. Now, you told me that there was nothing scheduled for Pride at this location. However, you've just said that Pride has submitted a letter that includes this venue in their request. What's the difference? So, so is it or is it there, not there part is of the no, festival? There, as far as I can understand there's no official pride event going on but establishments are allowed to add their name onto events much like BIAs they give us a list if if we could put up the previous motion there's lists of uh, for north by northeast for okay. um, yep. there's one for uh, there are the rest of the ones for pride um, and they give us lists of places that are doing j just want to stay open a little bit later and so it it's our responsibility to so that yeah they're not official events they're getting an extension for the Pride weekend till 4 a.m. Okay. And most of the complaints we get are at closing time when residents, or when when party goers, move up through uh, move up through Parkdale. Okay, okay. I, I appreciate it, and I understand the concerns that you have with the venue and the history there. Is there any history of issues during the Pride Festival at that venue? No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, they've never requested the extension. I don't believe. Okay. Thank you. A point of order, Councillor Diciano. I just want to know why this wasn't pre-circulated. I mean, there's a list. There's tons of there's tons of language on this thing, and it just goes on my screen faster than I can. Okay, possibly can we read. have can we have the clerk circulate like, that we, motion, please? We got to circulate please. this. It, it, Sorry, we can't just vote on. So we can't just no. vote blindly. Yes. There's a, a, a list, a full Every list of, of establishments, and we're picking on the same person over and over That's, and over. That's. Uh, I just Madam want Speaker, to know, on a point of order. I want to know. On a point of order. On a point of privilege. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. 
Councillor DiCiano, you've asked for the motion to be circulated. I've asked the staff to circulate it. Let's hold the item down then. Okay, well, I'm not taking a five minute recess. Okay, we have an item. The, the one that we just added. The one that we just added. We can put it on MM 19.43. All in favor? Carry. One could be deferred. Uh, Councillor McMahon, yes? S since um, we have a bit of time, I'd, I'd just like to make an announcement if I could. Should I? Well, since we have some time to spare. No, hold on. They still get to operate, they just don't get their extended hours. I don't know, they have like this magic spell over these guys. It must be the... Where the magic? It's like, is it the free drug? Herbal magic. Oops. Kelly, you have a motion to introduce certain bills. I do, Speaker, that leave be granted to introduce bills 529 to 585 inclusive. Shall leave be granted to introduce these bills? Recorded vote. Speaker, on a point of order. Yes? I would like to vote on 585 separately, please. Okay. We're just oh, okay. introducing. We're just introducing recorded vote. Yes, yes, we're just introducing right now. Cert the bills. Councillor DiCiano, please. Just so they can see what the subject matter is. The motion to introduce the bills carries unanimously, 31 in favor. Okay, so we're going to separate. Okay, so um, uh, bill number 585, we're going to vote on that separately. Recorded vote. 585. It's the Mimical Judson one. Recorded vote. Bill 585 is enacted. The vote is 17 to 14. Okay, on, um, on the, um, the remainder, the balance of the bills. All in favor, recorded vote. The 
recorded, recorded vote. Yeah, I know. John, John. Councillor McMahon, please. Councillor Davis. Councillor Burnside, please. Councillor Kelly and Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Layton, your vote, please. The motion to enact the balance of the bills carries unanimously 31 in favor. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Speaker. You have a motion regarding absentees. I do. Thank you. That uh, Council excuse the absence of Councillor Ron Moser from the June 7, 8, and 9th city, 2016 City Council meeting. Okay, all, all, all in favor, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor DiCiano, please. The motion to excuse uh, the absentee carries unanimously. 31 in favor. We'll do the confirming bill after, right? Yeah. Is the motion being circulated? The members, pardon?
is, did everybody get, uh, did every, we're trying to recess, okay, did everybody get a copy of that motion so we can continue? Yes. Councillor McMahon, yes. Yes. So um, I just want to make a quick announcement. Since we are a music city and we've all voted for that and support that, to encourage councillors and their staff to uh, participate and enjoy live from City Hall. They've been playing downstairs on a, on a monthly and sometimes weekly basis, but they're moving outside every Thursday, uh, July 7th to Labor Day. So I hope you can come. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's continue. I'll Okay, yes, we are ready. They've all got copies for, for per questions. Councillor Thompson? Uh, speaker, uh, in, in that vein, I'd like to uh, invite uh, members of council to visit us for the uh, 13th uh, annual uh, Taste of Lawrence Street Festival that will take place July 8th, 9th, and 10th, which will be after our, uh, actually before, before our next yeah. uh, council meeting. So I wanted to make that particular announcement today. We'd like to invite everyone um, to come out. Friday night, obviously, is the VIP event, uh, and certainly all day Saturday the 9th and all afternoon Sunday. Okay, members of council, we have to finish this item. Okay, but well, we're waiting because Councillor Car Okay, who, who's got questions on this now? Councillor Caragianis? Okay, let's, let's go to the questions. Yes. Councillor Kergianis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure if that would be the... the, the Councillor Layton, across. there's a question to you. Yeah, the yes. question is, um, I see a whole bunch of uh, other ones that um, you have suggested that it's okay for them to be at until 4 a.m. And um, in that, I was wondering, those are in residential neighborhoods, which is right next door to houses. Why are you singling out um, music? at 15 Saskatchewan when it's in a, uh, it's in, in a park? So it, it, it's not actually the, the, the proximity to residential that I'm taking issue with. It's their ability to not get complaints. And so in a, regardless of where the place is, when I get a request, I go in and I check my records from what calls I've got received as a result. I, I consult with MLS. And I, uh, in this case, I look to the adjacent councillor, who I know has, has received requests from his, uh, uh, complaints from his community because I get CC'd on them and my staff get CC'd on them. So they don't end up in my database because we don't, we don't typically database that information from other, uh, other wards. But in this well, case, uh, we, we were aware the, of them. Um, the councillors in the other um, three pages, if they had any complaints? You, you know what? The, our clerk's office actually circulates it because they know that uh, that, said, that sir, all of our individual ask, offices do. Uh, you said that you ask councillors in their ward. So my question to you is, for the other ones, the other three pages, did you save the same courtesy to the councillors that are there? So if I could just explain my comment. I don't, sur I, don't, I don't search out every address on that list. I do the ones for Ward 19. This happens to be in Ward 19, which is why it got on my attention. There are other ones on that list in Ward 19 I do the same thing for. Um, we, uh, we, we have this list, and this is just a, a fraction of the list we actually deal with on a monthly basis. It is circulated to all councillors beforehand with the assumption... On this, the three-page list are actually in your ward. I believe there's three on that three-page list. Is there any ones that are very closer to other wards? Uh, that, no, there are not. There are not. Okay. Thank you. But I encourage my, my colleagues to look Thank at their you. list as well, because I know that others have removed names on other occasions. We typically do this at Toronto and East York Community Council. Um, Deputy Mayor Men and Wong, do you have a question as well? That's why I put my name down on the list. Yes. That's why yes. It works. I don't know. Sometimes people put their names and then they change their mind. Oh, then I would have taken my name off the list. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, I think this has been a long day. It has been. Yes. Three days. Yes. This is devolving into a Seinfeld episode. Yes. Um, yes. Save <laughs> I have. So no I'll try. Way. I'll try. <laughs> ask my Save questions. That, that, um, so I'm curious, uh, Madam Chair, whether the council can inform us if there are currently any uh, MLS violations or property standards violations that are currently uh, assigned to this property. I, I'm not sure about MLS violations, but we do also check our. Um, uh, our 
internal database for calls we've received. You, know, I, you said that a few times, so yeah. I, I am aware of that. So you're not aware of any MLS outstanding MLS violations? Are you aware of any property standards violations that are outstanding that haven't been? I, I am not. No. So, so we don't. So you, so, so y you are not aware of any outstanding violations that they have committed um, that would give us any reason based on, on those particular. I mean, if, 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 if they weren't, uh, if they had some violations and they weren't complying with them, certainly members of council might have some concern with this. But you can't tell us that, that you know that they're that they're pretty clean based in terms of the violations. They don't have any violations against them. Councilman Minamong, there was a shooting there within 12 months ago, and there has been one reoccurring uh, every summer for the last three summers. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, oh. that the concerns from the neighbors. Okay, okay, we have. Oh, just okay, if we, I may. Hold on, oh, we sorry. Have, there's a point of order. Yeah, point of order. Yes. Madam Chair, it was said that there's a shooting there. That's not correct. It is. That's it's not it correct. Is. It's in the vicinity. Not oh, correct. The vicinity. Not there. Okay, oh. Councillor Caratiani, no, that's not. A, that's not that a point of order. It was actually there. Okay. It was, it, it was, oh, I, Jim, it, Jim, it was I, on the I really don't think that this item is going to be completed today. So. No, really, I don't, because I, I don't think anybody, like, yeah. So, okay, Madam Chair, ahead. just on that, just on that particular point, if I may. Yeah. Um, as, as I'm not a, you know, I, I don't confess to be an expert on this, and this is one of my reasons of concern in that we don't have any other material in front of us, but the, the council raised the issue of, of particular shootings and safety, but is it not true what you may have omitted? My understanding is, is that this particular uh, 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 club has put in significant and substantial uh, security procedures and metal detectors and has put in a lot of staff to make their, organ their, their place a lot more safe to make sure that, that the patrons are not subject to any uh, any unsafe environment. Councillor, if you had heard is, from is my, that not true? If you had heard from my previous answers, it, this was that is not the uh, the only reason that I'm highlighting uh, that 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 we are uh, removing this from the list of of approvals. Well, um, you raised the issue of, of safety, and therefore you only so told one half of the story. Don't you think the complete story should be should be told? Hey, that was your last question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Thompson, clarification. Um, speaker, the questions that the Deputy Mayor has asked were the lines of questions that I was going to be pursuing, and I don't need to follow that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fletcher, clarification. And I just want to run quickly through the process for this, for everybody. An application comes in for an extension. It's not automatic. Is that right? Yes. And then uh, the councillor is apprised of that because they may know something about that location and have a <coughs> question or a disagreement. Is that yes. right? Okay. And the councillor then tells you either it's at community please. council or here councillor at council. Councillor Fletcher, just clarification of the mo I motion. I am not clarifying the, the motion. No. I'm clarifying how it got to that particular point. But, so what's your clarification on C Councillor Layton's motion? My clarification, I'm trying to clarify that nothing is, nobody is being picked on here, that there's a standard procedure, and I'm elucidating this council on what the standard procedure is from the chair of the community council. Why I can't clarify that, I just don't know. Are you rolling that out of order? No, I'm not. Just please continue and let's let's get on. Um, really, um. I'm sorry. Oh, go There's ahead. questions here, and I'm going to point of order. There's questions here in this chamber that make it very clear that councillors don't understand this procedure because they don't generally have these types of extensions. And there's nobody picking on a business. We are going through a list. Councillor Fletcher, can you continue asking your question, please? Thank you. Pardon me? Pardon me? I don't, I didn't, I didn't say Councillor Karagiannis had something to say. I don't, I didn't hear him. Councillor Karagiannis, please stop interrupting. Okay, I... Okay, go ahead, Count. Uh, I'm just Councilor. clarifying with you the normal process. Is this any, is this outside the normal process in any way? No. From standard, got a concern, and then it gets voted on one way or another at community council or at this council. It's also very common that we get the list at this later time. 
it's very it's very common that we get common. the list of that's additions right. at the latest possible moment because a lot of these organizations forget to add their names earlier. And that's why you hold it. And on, on a point of uh, on a point of I have another order. One. Councillor Lane, please, you're, we're in the middle of questions. You can't have a point of order when somebody's asking I'm you a question. about quorum. Thank you. I know we don't have quorum. That's why I said we're not going to finish this item. Exactly. the item, then we don't give extensions to anybody. Exactly. The items, no one gets an extension. Exactly. And that's, no, that's not fine. No, I didn't say fine. I said that's exactly. Okay, members of council, Councillor Lane, can I can I have a quorum call, please? We we need to we need to deal with this item. Members of council, no, a quorum call. Members, the voting panel is open. Would you please press uh, either yes or no to indicate your presence in the chamber? Councillor Thompson, please. Councillor Fletcher, please. Okay, members of council, you need to remain in your seats. Councillor Layton? Councillor Layton, please. Councillor Davis, please. And Councillor Lee, thank you. Madam Speaker, quorum is present. There are 27 members in the chamber. Okay. <laughs> we'll now go to speakers. I, I just... Members of Council, Councillor Cressy, please. I just want to... I just want to clarify what we have before us today. Motion 1A that Councillor Layton has circulated a copy of the motion, that was on yesterday. When we were going through the agenda, that was on yesterday's agenda. This happens at every council meeting where there's a list. There's also a list for, for every other community council, and we vote on it. The only difference is that 1B, when we wanted to release the item yesterday, Councillor Layton was waiting for a letter, okay? And that's why he introduced 1B today. So 1A is what we do every council meeting. It's 1B, I think, that members of council have an issue with. So if you're asking the question, it's on 1B, not on 1A, because that's a usual practice at every council meeting for liquor licenses. Okay, just to make it clear. Okay, Councillor Mamaliti to speak. I want to, uh, first of all, thank Councillor Layton for uh, quickly jumping up and recognizing that I may have uh, some concerns with this. And it, and the reason he's done that is because of the history of, of and I guess the back and forth. Uh, we typically disagree on, on how uh, people have dealt with uh, a, a particular uh, place, that being uh, music in the city. Uh, I have felt that, uh, that people pick on, on the company for no reason uh, uh, at all, quite frankly, in most cases. And that uh, the same sorts of things that they try to impose on this one company, they don't do. Uh, when I say they, I mean Councillor Layton and Councillor Perks are, are two regulars at, at throwing it at, at music on a regular basis. And I say uh, no to that. I say if you're going to do it with one, then do it with everybody. At the same time, I do understand communities' needs. I understand it because there are com uh, community members that feel that places shouldn't have an extension uh, when it comes to these kinds of things. And I also understand that there may have been a last minute kind of thing here. But that doesn't make it fair. It doesn't make it fair based on what I'm reading here. Here's what this means, everybody. This is what we didn't see. What Councillor Layton is doing here is he's taking the whole list of, of requests for extensions and he's approving all of them. The, uh, the Jazz Festival, he's approving um, uh, Oasis, Aqua Lounge, 
uh, he's he, uh, zippers. Uh, he's uh, he's agreeing to uh, Hurit Cafe. He's agreeing to um, Bovin Club, Cameron Public House, Drake Hotel. Drake uh, want for the same event, by the way, for the same event, the Pride event. Okay, uh, the Garrison, the Har the Hark Luck uh, uh, Bar, the Horseshoe Tavern, Lee's Palace, Nocturne uh, on Queen Street, the Office Pub Lounge. Rivoli on Queen Street, the Rockin', Rockin' House Saloon on Adelaide, the Silver Dollar, the Smiling Buddha, Sneaky D's, the Velvet Underground on Queen Street. The same argument that he used uh, for, uh, for uh, not agreeing to the extension of music, I'd be hard pressed to find out that none of these that he's approving today have never had a problem in them, never had a shooting, never had any issues with liquor licenses, none of it. I'd be hard pressed to find out that that's the case. In fact, I would bet you that all of them have had li uh, liquor concerns. I've had questions about, about uh, when they're open, when they're not. All the same sorts of issues that he and his community are deciding not to uh, increase uh, uh, music's requests. The only one left on the list, by the way, and at the 11th hours, which scares me the most. To do stuff like this as soon as the meeting ends, at the last minute, without giving us notice, a written notice, but hey, I, by the way, this is what I'm doing. Oh, and Councillor Mamalita, you're about to leave, so I thought you would know this. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, community's concerns. I just think that this is a buildup, yet again, of trying to embarrass trying to uh, put a, a, a reputation on a company that's doing its best, a company that's had to defend themselves uh, from two different counselors regularly. Uh, it's, it's like a boxing match uh, uh, with, with uh, the company's hands tied behind their back. Now we've got debates as of tomorrow. We've got other debates in terms of what's going on uh, at Exhibition Place. This doesn't help. And I think, quite frankly, it's being done on purpose. I think it's being done on purpose to this company. Okay, just one moment. Point of personal privilege, Councillor Layton. The councillor has suggested that that the timing of this is by by some form and fashion contrived by myself and the other local councillor. Um, considering that we got this from clerks yesterday, uh, I find it slightly difficult to uh, to to understand. Uh, that how he's coming to that conclusion and I think that is it is in fact taking a, uh, a, a direct attack on the character of myself and my well, colleague. Councillor Layton, uh, you did indicate yesterday the letter came in yesterday so that letter could have been circulated yesterday. Uh, Madam Speaker, the letter was circulated yeah. in our communications yeah. package. Every member, okay. Every member of Councillor got it. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking Councilor what... Councillor Mamaliti, can you continue? I'm taking on what the <coughs> councillor has been telling me about community consultation and how important it is for the community for this motion to pass. I find it hard, very hard to believe that in a 24-hour period, if that's the case, that there's been extensive consultation for, with the community and that all of these communities have been consulted with by both these councillors. In 24 hours, we were here yesterday. We were here yesterday, and we're hearing that there's been extensive consultation, and that's why he's moving the motion. Okay? Now, I, I find it hard to believe that all of these here today are being approved with extensive consultation, and there's one left out of the pictures with extensive consultation. Okay, I find it hard to believe. Councillor Mamaliti, point of order. Hold on. I'll put your time on hold. On a point of privilege. The, the councillor has suggested that I said I did extensive consultation. That is not what I did or my normal course of practice in this. And I made it very clear what that was. And I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't make suggestions of things that I said that I didn't say. So you didn't have consultation, uh, right? Francis. No, but is that, no, Councillor Layton, is that, what, is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm just asking the question. He has suggested I do extensive consultation on these matters when the day that I receive it. That is clearly not the case. I never suggested that it was. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor, continue. 
So is it extensive consultation? Was there consultation? Wasn't there consultation? The 11th hour tells us that there was some kind of consultation. They know they automatically knew know what the community is thinking. Is that worth a last minute motion to drop somebody out of an equation because you think that you know the feeling of your particular community? I have the right to speak. Yes, your time is up, though. No, I put your time on hold during the interruptions. Councillor Wong Tam, to speak. Yes, thank you, Ramesh, um, Speaker. And uh, and I want to draw um, the members of council's attention to the fact that this is a regular order of practice that we undertake at this uh, city council. And if, if anything, I think what it has done is it's highlighted um, uh, an administrative process that we need to review. Uh, and I am obviously, I mean, we, we have the Pride Festival being hosted in the city of Toronto. It's now gone from Pride Week to Pride Month. And, uh, and just about everybody is looking for a alcohol um, service extension. And whether they actually have um, uh, any affinity or any partnership, formal or otherwise, to Pride, or if they're actually uh, putting uh, dollars into Pride programming, uh, that's never revealed here. But what is revealed is that the lists of, uh, of, uh, of participants and, and requests get longer and longer. So therefore, whether it's Pride or the, the, uh, the Caribbean uh, Carnival Festival or North by Northeast, everybody wants to be lumped together. And what this uh, discussion has unveiled today is something that we've all sort of suspected, I think, in the downtown uh, Toronto East Shore Community Council for some time, is that we need to, to, to build even greater clarity to it. And I would actually um, just draw your attention to the fact that there's, uh, there's actually three uh, establishments that are falling under the Pride Toronto Festival banner uh, under, the, uh, under Motion A uh, with the uh, removal of uh, what's proposed in Motion B. Um, but in the past, what we've actually done done is there have been times where I've had to remove establishments uh, who have asked for those extensions where we know we've had ongoing reoccurring problems. And some of those problems have been uh, AGCO infractions, uh, they have been overcrowding, uh, they have been, um, whether it's uh, service to minors, uh, noise disruptions, and uh, and the list of infractions will go on. And oftentimes they're not things that, that uh, I will do uh, without, uh, without little consideration for even even the establishment owner or the uh, or the operator, uh, but oftentimes it's done in consultation, and we try to work proactively with those establishments to let them know good behavior will be rewarded, bad behavior will not. And the and when you when you get to that stage where you have to remove someone from the, from the list of, of uh, uh, for the alcohol extension request, it's because the they have not come into compliance or they become a property that's operating and causing nuisance to the community. And, uh, and you'll recognize that this has to happen. Otherwise, you will be able to just very blankly in, in one fell swoop uh, approve all sorts of, of requests for extensions without a lot of scrutiny. And I think it's our responsibility uh, to represent the interests of our neighborhood. And I think it's our responsibility to ensure that establishments who are operating under the rules are going to be given their exemptions. And those who do not will be told, not this year, you don't get to serve alcohol from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., you have to stop at 2 a.m. That's all this is, nothing more. And I think that Councillor Layton, uh, in the way he's actually approached uh, this particular matter, I think he's done it with a lot of respect uh, for the councillors who, who may have uh, personal friendships with the operator of that establishment. And I think he's actually done it with a lot of uh, consideration by even reaching out to Pride Toronto. He reached out to myself and said, you know, is this a problem and is this a concern? I said, no, but let me check with the organizer of Pride Toronto to find out if this is going to be a, a concern for them. And then they responded to, to, to him, they responded to myself and said, no, go ahead. And that's what we have today. So this was not an underhanded move, and it's something that happens quite regularly, and you do vote on this quite regularly. You actually, as a matter of fact, vote on, on, on the matters, and, and similar matters such as this, every single council meeting, and I've never seen a council erupt in, in such a way. And I think uh, you're, that there is, to me, a bit of overreaction. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McConnell. Um, so I'll be very uh, <clears throat> quick, uh, Madam Speaker. I'll just say um, that the extension of a, a liquor license is a privilege. It is not a right, and it is for good, uh, uh, for good behavior. So I'll give you the example. When I look at this, I see the Phoenix Concert Theatre. Now, 
I've had problems with the, with the Phoenix in the past, but they've come into compliance over the last little while, and I know that in my office I've had no complaints over the last 18 months or so. So I say, fine, we'll, we'll give it another shot, no problem. If we have problems, next time you come, you won't get it. That's the way it's done. It's done all the time at the Community Council. The difference is that these ones came in late. They didn't come in late because of Councillor Layton. They didn't come in late because of the Community Council. They came in late because they were submitted late. Um, and so now we're kind of on our feet trying to figure out what to do. And I would suggest that we just get to the vote and figure out, Councillor Layton has said this is a problem in his ward. It's a problem in Councillor Perks's ward. For me, none of the other ones are of issue, and I didn't pull mine off. Thank you. Mayor Tory to speak. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I, it's unfortunate this is coming the way it does, but that's just timing with when the letter arrived and so on. I just really wanted to echo, I think, the comments, if I understood them correctly, of, of Councillor Wong Tam. I think we have to be very careful when we make these kinds of decisions uh, about um, uh, fairness and about due process. A lot of my friends on the council would be the first to speak, and quite properly so, about due process. And, and I just think when it comes in this manner and this, the way this whole practice works, and I've read, the, I read through the community council minutes, so I see the pages and pages of these, and, and, and I, all I think to myself is, well, uh, you know, if you say yes to one and no to the other, did the people you said no to have a chance to, to say anything about why they were turned down? And did anybody, uh, has anybody looked, for example, in anybody else's records at Nocturne and Hotel 5050 and Bloke and Forth and Same Club Inc. Silver and Dollar, let's so, the, some, so somebody silver has dollar. Ask the question about Silver Dollar. Well, uh, so, you're so you're telling me that everybody's got looked at the records because we it was discussed dollars. in here that people have looked at the records and decided whether there were complaints or not. And I'm aware of some of the other incidents that have been referred to already today. I just think as a matter of fairness and the kind of due process we'd be proud of wanting to have in every other area of our business, that this thing, and I, that's really all I want to speak out, this, this thing deserves the kind of re-examination as to how this works that Councillor Wong Tam referred to because I just think it, we, we might get ourselves in trouble one day um, over something that seems like a very small, very simple decision and somebody says, well, you, 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 you chose to single us out without any hearing, no, you know, it, it isn't a public meeting, we're here, but I mean, it came at the last minute, half the people in the council have left. I mean, it's not really the ideal way to do this, either generally speaking or in this particular matter. Um, and I think Councillor Wong Tam's uh, suggestion to review the process is a good one. Uh, I'm not sure if I can think of a better one offhand, but I just think this is concerning in the sense that you are making a decision. And, and both these councillors have told me before about the number of complaints they receive about this establishment as regards noise, not as regards noise and nuisance, I would call it, as opposed to other incidents. And so I'm prepared to accept the fact that that's what they get. Um, but anyway, that was the point I wanted to make about the process. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Uh, just to address uh, uh, just a couple of points. This was put in, at, considered at the last minute because it's here at council. When you're organizing a big event, you generally know your requests go to community council, which makes recommendations to council. All of our community councils make recommendations to council on these issues. And then when you put it in at the last minute, you haven't just been on top of what your requirements are. So this is the way it works. They put it in at the last minute, and here it is for us to make a decision. So yes, it's a public decision, but we have to make a decision. That's what's in front of us. I do want to say, there, Councillor Wong Tang checked with pride and said, if this venue didn't go ahead, is that a problem? Da, 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 that's what I heard her say. And they said, that's fine. It's a privilege. When you have a club that wants an extension, it's a privilege. The mayor has said, do we know everything about all these places? I don't believe there have been a number of shootings at these places. I'm drawing the line, just as we had to do on the Danforth, when there's a place where there have been murders. Not just one, but more. And yesterday, we spent a lot of time discussing what we're going to do about gun violence. Turn your guns in. So I'm sorry. It's a privilege. If the local councillor believes that it may be dangerous because dangerous things have happened there, why do you have that privilege? 
I don't support that. I wouldn't support that for the venue where there was three murders on the Danforth. I would not support that. We fought hard to end that practice, to stop that, to have people realize that murder right on your front step is a murder at your business. So I don't support gun violence. I don't support gunplay. I don't support murder at venues. And I don't support extending automatically uh, license just because you have people here that think you should have it. I simply don't. We're talking out of two sides of our face here, people, if we're going to do both of those things. We understand it's going to be a difficult summer. Why would we do that? You can't make a motion one day to turn in all your guns and another day to give extensions to businesses that have had violent gun acts at their venue. That's my dividing line. I don't know what yours is. That's mine. Thank you. Councillor Kergiannis. Madam Chair, um, I read the list and it goes on and on and on. And I'm looking at one particular place called the Silver Dollar Room at 486 Spadina Avenue. I would guess to remember, I could be wrong here, but I feel that uh, Silver Dollar has had difficulties in the past. Councillor Cressy, you could speak on it if you want. It has a history of difficulties. At one point in time, there were about 233 charges that were laid. One point in time, like... Okay. So, like... Um, point of privilege, Councillor Cressy. The venue in question is located in Ward 20, and in fact, the local residents' association, in collaboration with my office, has supported this application based on their record of compliance in recent years. Thank you. Thank you. No. Um, and... I am feeling that we're singling out. You want to put my time and stop until everybody, put, Chair, put my time and stop. I mean, that's funny. The city wants to get rid of Georgia. <laughs> Good work. No, don't do that. I miss him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the dirtiest session I've ever been in. Members of Council, do we just want to recess or adjourn because I, I don't, no, hold on, please stop screaming. Stop, no, but just please because I don't think that members of Council want to continue with this debate because I, everybody is screaming at each other. So my question to you is, do we want to continue on the item or not? Okay, then please, can we have some order? Please. Okay, Councillor Kerchianis, please Madam just speak Chair, on what I, we I'm have calling, before us. I'm calling for the vote. I'm calling for the vote. You can't, you can't, I know you can't. Uh, Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you, Bert. Councillor Perks to speak. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, much has been said about this and how the process works. Uh, for those of you who don't have uh, an awful lot of these applications, I want to talk to you a little bit about how the practice works in my office. It might, might be instructive. Every single month, every single month at Toronto East York Community Council, we get a circulation from the clerk for what we affectionately know as the party clause. That's all the liquor license applications for extended hours. We maintain a file on each and every one of these locations in my office. Who's complained? When was the last time municipal licensing and standards was there? Has there been a, a, a terrible incident recently? And so on. When we get the list, my staff review it against our files. And if there are ongoing problems, then we flag it and we indicate to the clerk that no, we don't want this one getting the extended hours. Another part of the process you need to be aware of is that with each of the problem locations, I talk to the manager or the owner 
of that site and say, this is why I am not, extend, I am not voting to extend your hours from 2 to 4 a.m. And it's worth noting, the music nightclub will be open until 2 a.m. on these dates. We're just saying, I don't want to give you the additional hours. When I sit down with that operator, I say, these are the nature of the complaints I've been getting. This is the nature of the, the problem you have with the community. Are you prepared to work with me to solve those problems? And in many venues, yes, we have been able to solve the problems. And then we put that into the file so when my staff are checking next month or six months from now, we're able to say, those guys have made an improvement. We'll let them go through. None of this is arbitrary. None of it is last minute. None of it is singling anybody out. It is the practice that every single member of the Toronto East York Community Council, where we deal with literally hundreds of these, has in place to represent our constituents well. I will tell you right now that if I, if I did vote today to grant an extension to this license, my staff and I would be on the phone all day tomorrow, all day Monday, all day Tuesday, and for each and every one of the days that there was a liquor license extension at this place. I can tell you five minutes on, on Monday morning, the first five minutes in my office during the summer, I get the whole list of complaints about this one location and maybe two others in my ward of all the people who phoned in about how Friday night and Saturday night went. These are not small problems. Because of the geography, with, with Music Nightclub being down below and then the community being up above on the embankment, as you know the, the lands are there, the sound carries. I, get, I have one very intrepid constituent who will send me the music playlist. This is what they played between 1.30 a.m. and 2.15. This is not a small problem. This is not me or Councillor Layton singling somebody out. This is a recurring problem that we have with this facility. And I would further remind you, before you vote, remember the motion we all voted on just yesterday that Caesar, Pal Councillor Palacio put in front of us, asking the Alcohol and Gaming Commission to review the liquor licenses of every facility where there were suspected gun activities. This is not a place where there have been suspected gun activities. This is a place where last summer someone was shot on the premises and the previous summer someone was murdered outside the premises. So this is not some surprise. If this is coming as a surprise to anyone on council, that's a surprise to me because you've heard me on this topic before. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davis to speak. I'd like to call the question. Okay, the question's been called. Courted vote. No, this is to call the question. Recorded vote. No, no. We're just. Councillor Davis just moved to call the question. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Cho, please. Councillor Karagiannis. The motion to end debate carries 26 to 2. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, members. So we have Councillor Layton's motion 1A. Do you want to vote on them separately, 1A? Okay. 1A. Oh gosh, 
Do you know what? It's been a long day, and I think everybody's hungry. Yeah. Not. We can, Councillor Mamaliti. We can vote on one A. So, okay, hold on, please, please. What you can vote on separately is just 14, 15, and then 16 is all one. But that's my ruling. That's my ruling. Okay? Okay, 14, on 14, recorded vote. Oh, sorry. Let me put the mic on. I'm sorry. If we pass Motion 1A, why is it necessary to, to pass Motion 1B? Because 1A sends forward the list of those in respect of which there is no objection. And what, what, why is Motion 1B there? I'm just well, asking a procedural question. I, I believe, and may the clerk can clarify, because the request, there was a request for 1B. So th they've applied. They've applied. 1B, they've applied. Because, the, because of what was explained to me, I guess, by somebody over here, which is that the law requires us to say whether we object or not. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Because they've applied, so yeah. 1B is saying no to that Another one. Another reason to reform the process. Uh, am I correct on that to the solicitor? Yes. Okay. All right. So number 14, recorded vote. Councillor Palacio, please. Councillor Davis, thank you. The uh, part uh, 14 of Motion 1A carries unanimously 29 in favor. Okay, 15. I thought it was the whole item. I just, I just, yeah, I just saw the yellow in front of me, but I wasn't paying attention. I think I'm getting a bit. Councillor Burnside, please. Part 15 of Motion 1A carries unanimously 29 in favor. 16. Yeah, Councillor Davis, Councillor Cho, please. Deputy Mayor Minna Wong. Councillor Davis and Councillor Cho, please. Part 16 of Motion 1A carries. The vote is 27 to 2. Okay, 17. Recorded vote. Councillor Cho, please. Councillor Perks. Councillor Birdside, please. Thank you. Part 17 of Motion 1A carries. The vote is 20, <laughs> 27 to 2. 18. Councillor Cho, please. <coughs> Councillor Fletcher, please. Councillor Cho. Um. 
Part 18 of Motion 1A carries unanimously. 30 in favor. 19. Councillor Layton, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor McMahon. Part 19 of Motion 1A carries unanimously 30 in favor. 20. Councillor Cressy, please. Councillor Cho, please. Councillor Layton, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor McMahon, Councillor DiGiorgio, and Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor DiGiorgio is not here. Oh, he was. Okay. Councillor Councillor McMahon. Part 20 of Motion 1A carries unanimously. 30 in favor. 21. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Carroll, Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Peruzza. <laughs> Councillor Davis, thank you. Part 21 of Motion 1A carries. The vote is 28 to 2. Okay, Motion 1B. Recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza, please. Motion 1B carries. The vote is 24 to 6. Okay. I item as amended. On um, favor. Recorded vote. Item as amended. Councillor. Councillor Fat Fletcher voted the wrong way on that Carol. one. Carol. Carol. Uh, Council, sorry, Councillor Carroll. I was on the prevailing side. Councillor Councillor Perks is moving to reopen. Okay, recorded vote on the reopening. Members, we canceled the previous vote, so your lights may still be lit up, so please make sure you've pressed the button. Councillor Peruzza, please. Councillor Cho. The motion to reopen the vote on uh, Motion 1B carries 28 to 2. Okay, on 1B, recorded vote. Councillor DeBearmaker, please. Councillor Matlow, please. The revote on motion 1B carries. The vote is 26 to 4. Councillor Campbell. Come on, buddy. Oh, Councillor Campbell? I do. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Item is amended. Recorded vote. Okay, members of council, if you have the purple sheets on your on your desk, if you can please put them in the bin. Councillor Mamalee. Proper bins, I'll 
there. Don't leave them on your desk. Councillor Davis, please. Councillor Carroll, Councillor Karagiannis, and Councillor Thompson. Councillor Fletcher, please. Please don't leave. We still have another vote. The item is amended carries 29 to 1. Okay. Councillor Campbell, you have a motion to introduce the confirming bill. Yes, Madam Speaker, that leave be granted to introduce a bill to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council meeting 19 on June 7th, 8th, and 9th, 2016. Shall leave be granted to in introduce this bill? Recorded vote. Councillor Mamaliti, please. Councillor Lee, your vote, please. Yes. The motion to introduce the confirming bill carries 28 to 1. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw? Recorded vote. Councillor Mehevic, please. I think, I think we're going to have to look at a new poli Councilor process. Councillor can we have do you vote, please. Kelly, Councillor Karajianis. With the liquor licenses. Have to look Deputy at Mayor Minnewong, please. Councillor Mehevic, please. Councillor Kelly, please. The motion to enact the confirming bylaw carries unanimously. 29 in favor. Okay. Motion to adjourn. No, oh, you want to stay? Uh, thank you very much to staff again. Thank you to members of council. And thank you.